everybody. Welcome to Frame Trap, the podcast that you think is either too short or too long. Joining me on this episode is... Are we is... voting? Can I... <laughs> yes, vote. Give me your vote. Brandon Jones at the end there. It's just enough. Like, Goldi- just enough. like Goldilocks. It's the, it's the porridge in the middle. I was thinking the same thing, dude. I was we're gonna, gonna say that. We're take, we will accept the pandering. Very welcome on this podcast. That's Brandon Jones. Right next to him, Sekiro Land Bradley Ellis. Yeah, it could be a little long. <laughs> it, could be a little <laughs> it, it depends for me. Yeah, um, sure. I think two and a half hours to three hours is the sweet like pot four hours. Spot. I think we did like a three and a half hour one one time I was yeah. on, and I was just like, it's, it was yeah. sick. But I was I was done. I after can that. I can tell. I mean, obviously people have different preferences, but I can tell after an episode where I'm like, okay, that was <laughs> like you, you always have that like post shoot guilt where you're like, oh man, I wish I could have changed this, that, or yeah, the other. Yeah, yeah. Um, but trying to find that sweet spot this episode, I'm gonna be your host. Ben Moore, uh, and I want to tell you guys up front, it's been an up and down week for Easy Allies in terms of just physical health. As you can tell, Brandon Jones is a little sick. I've been feeling a little sick. Kyle Bossman isn't even here uh, because he's been sick, and so I think just from the anniversary, traveling and all that stuff, we've been having a bug yeah. going around. You know what helps you get through illness, though, Ben? What's that? Video games. Do they? Yeah. I was going to ask you guys, my, my uh, opening bit for this is, do you have any sickness rituals that you like to do or just habits that you get into when you're sick that make you feel better? Uh, no, it's just like when, you know, I, I, I love my wife, but I think I love her more than ever when I'm sick because she's just like amazing. Oh, know, yeah? We had, we, had, we had ramen for lunch. She just put some ramen together. And nice. Like this, hit the spot. Mm-hmm. I'm running on ramen right now. <laughs> Good, good, good thing to run on. Brad, do you do uh, anything that we need my, to sick? When I sit in my chair to play games, blanket on the lap, yeah, yeah. hood up, yeah, hood up. Sweatshirt. <laughs> That's the special yeah. sickness. Yeah. Like this is and how I look. Lots of water. Yeah. Yeah. Tons of water. Lots of fluids. Lots of water. Uh, I feel like I just do the same thing I normally do, which is play video games. Yeah. But <laughs> as I was reflecting on this question, the times that I remember the most are when I was sick. I, I watched like a Pokemon movie that I missed. That should be my new ritual. That's a good like, one. Watch a Pokemon movie that I've missed because I've missed most of them. I remember playing so a lot of Final Fantasy Nine one time when I was sick when yeah. it came out. It's just when you're sick, like even when you try to get your mind off something. My my least favorite thing, I guess, when it comes to like general sickness, common sicknesses, is having the throat be sore. Because like right. everything Physically, that you do, yeah. it's like hard to immerse yourself into something. Because every time you swallow right. or mm-hmm. eat something or drink something, yeah, like you just bad. can't get over it. It sucks. Uh, what's better, a sick day from school or snow days that you have to make up? Uh, well, I grew up in California, so California. I guess California, that's true. So yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of the lens of winter. <laughs> I'm dealing with two California <laughs> yeah. boys here. They never had. Uh, they yeah. never had snow days. All right, Brad. I I remember the the greatest snow that I had is I had just gotten Majora's Mask for something. I think Christmas. Dude, I don't already, remember. Already a great day. And. Yeah. Uh, I it was a snow day and I was like so thrilled because mm-hmm. I was like I think I was playing Majora's Mask before school and I was on the second dungeon boss you know the guy that like rolls around oh yeah and you goat. roll around as the Goron yeah 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 that was a pretty good snow day yeah, that was a good snow day how was how does it feel man like a snow day I was always so jealous of the vibe I think both of us probably were uh, snow days are awesome you love them you pray for like it's it's like one of the things where like you watch the news mm-hmm. and you like see all the schools that are scrolling by and you hope that your school is one of them. Uh, they're good except for when you have really bad winners and you keep having to make up the days and you're like, oh man, like school would have been out a mm-hmm. week ago if we didn't have some That's snow true. days. So it's like good now, punishment later kind of thing. A but, lot of my roommates at Emerson and Boston uh, yeah. were <clears throat> from Boston. And I remember one guy was like, he's like, oh yeah, you know, I'd have to get up in the morning and, you know, shovel the car. <laughs> and I was like in there just hanging out and I chuckled to myself and he got He'd live it. He was like, oh, California boy over yeah. here. He's yeah. like, when I say shoveling, that means you're out in the front yard picking daisies. He's like, yeah. here in Boston, <laughs> shoveling means you're out cleaning the driveway, scraping the windshield. He's like, I, I, dude, I just chuckled, man. I'm sorry. I didn't say. Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I, look, I look back at it fondly now, but I would always shovel with my dad. Mm-hmm. And Co-op. like now it's like, oh, that was a good bonding experience. But at the time, especially in high school, kind of a bratty high school kid and like I would be playing games or something and my mom would be like get out there and help your dad dude same thing happened to me it was just outdoor like work mowing the lawn and all that stuff trimming stuff with my dad 
I don't think mowing the lawn. I mean, I guess we didn't have that big of a lawn. Gotcha. So if you have a huge lawn, you didn't I have land. Is that what you're telling me? We had we had land, but not the goats. To we were yeah, yeah, we didn't have any <laughs> have any animals or anything like that. It's not that different. Uh, <laughs> but I I always thought that shoveling was worse than sure, dude. Than mowing the lawn. Absolutely. But yeah, I don't know. My parents were were pretty chill. Shout outs to mom and dad. Yeah, shout outs to mom and dad. Uh, but there is a game that has consumed me, and it's definitely consumed Brad for work, and it would have anyway, I mean, let's be yeah. honest. Uh, and it's been consuming Brandon. Sure. Uh, and that game is Sekiro, Shadows Die Twice. Uh, it's a game that, like, I really want to dig into. Both Brad and I have finished it, mm-hmm. and Brandon, you're working your way through it. And I actually want to start with you, Brandon, because you're not, like... A Souls faithful person. Right. Not that this is a Souls game. I'm not trying to say yeah. that they're they're identical, <clears throat> but your uh, series with From Software, I think, is probably the most uh, distinct between the three of us here. And I kind of want to just get your general impressions on what you think of Sekiro so far. It's an interesting game because, like, I can get super nitpicky about Sekiro mm-hmm. because they're adding a lot of things to this that weren't in from from doing working on the souls retro yeah, and yeah, from yeah. working on reviews of those games and, f- and from having played bloodborne like three times mm-hmm. um there are definitely things that it feels like they're trying out that they've never done before yeah and so when i compare like it's so cool to have stealth elements in a soul in a in a from software game but if like i compare that to hitman or splinter cell or it's like not as oh, evolved yeah right so like there are things that um like ai wise and just the structure of how enemies move around and the awareness of them mm-hmm. n- with you and with other people um i can be super nitpicky about it but it's just like that game hit home for me within five seconds like there's just the, the first time i hit l1 to, to bring up the sword to block uh, the first time I used a grappling hook, um, the first time I just started running, like the first time I was like, just that game is so smooth and <laughs> navigating that world is so much fun. Yeah, that, I think the, it the was, jump feels so good. I think it was before the group stream, and in the moment I was just like, oh yeah, cool. But the more I thought about it, I was like, I'm not sure I, I fully understand. You were talking about Sekiro, and you you mentioned like, oh yeah, man, I just saw him bring up the sword like this to block, and I was in, and I was like, that's cool. What? Why? What is that? What is it about that specifically? I think that I think it it's, I think it's you so why. Much. Um, I think it's one of the reasons why I really liked Bloodborne and uh, also Neo, which obviously it's like impossible not to draw comparisons, but. Mm-hmm. Um, when I look at the Souls games, you were always fighting like gigantic monsters. Even when you're fighting humans, they were like abnormally large. Yeah. And so it was tough for me to get into a sense that like I'm actually fighting a, a person. Yeah. And that's what I really liked about Neo, just this standoff. You know, it's just like I'm moving left, he's moving left, and we're just staring at each other. And it's just like, who's going to go first? How are we going to react? Um, and that just I can get I get so much more into that when it when it comes to just like a one on one encounter with any given person. Um, and it makes like even just an enemy I know I'm going to destroy kind of special mm-hmm. if I want to take the time to just like, you know, right. intimidate him or. Um, so that's why I think I just kind of naturally gravitate toward a lot of their offshoot stuff. Um, I think I got into the not the grind, the flow of Bloodborne a little bit easier. Mm-hmm. I think the first, you know, like once I, you know, finally down the, the cleric beast, I was like, OK. And then, uh, you know, once I like. Uh, the the I took down the Bloodstarved Beast on like the first attempt on my second run, um, whereas like this one definitely feels much more stop and go. <laughs> yeah. Where like I'll have a boss that like only takes me two or three attempts. I'll be like, all right, I downloaded him. I know I know his patterns and others. I'm just like, okay, I might have to <laughs> like mm-hmm. check online or you know, <laughs> sure, send yeah. Brad or, or Ben a message on Slack and see what the <laughs> heck I'm doing wrong here. Uh, Brad, you. Yeah. Uh, reviewed Sekiro. Yes. I, I've reviewed. I reviewed Dark Souls three. I reviewed Bloodborne for game trailers, and I reviewed the Dark Souls two DLC mm-hmm. for game trailers. And I want to talk to you about the process of reviewing Sekiro because I think that this game is more difficult, in my opinion, than any of the ones that I just mentioned. Okay. Uh, was it stressful knowing that you had this game that could occasionally present pretty? Tough roadblocks, but you also like wanted to get the review done as quickly as possible. Yeah, yeah. and you're dealing Especially with anniversary things. It was a crazy week. I got the game yeah. really close to launch. Mm-hmm. I would like a day before I got to actually play it, so I was like trying to beat as fast as possible. But I'm really trying to take my time with it mm-hmm. and play through it like organically how I actually would. So yeah, it's kind of stressful, but I had a really good uh, experience with it because I've been waiting to do. Like, a big From Software game forever. Right. Like, I did Derecine, but it's just, like, a smaller VR title. Sure. So when this came around, I was ready for it, especially because I played the game a couple times before it was even out. Yeah. So I had, like, 
uh, I had some knowledge going in already, with a, which definitely helped. But uh, I had a lot of fun doing it. Um, you treat from so- software as pretty sacred. You and you. The, the other benefit that you have. That's true. Uh, I don't mean that as an insult. No, no, it's I true. Treat them I had a picture sacred. of Miyazaki on my wall at game trailers. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah I don't think it's a, it's an exaggeration. But uh, you did the retrospective. Yeah. Um, and so you you have kind of all of those games. I would say very fresh. Um, it's not yeah, like it's fresh. been ten years since no, you played yeah, them. No, yeah, it's been like a year um, or a year and a half since I played all of them. You did go to a preview event for Sekiro, mm-hmm. so you kind of had an idea going into it what it was going to be like. But I guess kind of going back to that preview event and having all of these other From Software games, uh, which this is definitely informed by, very different, but yes. informed by, uh, was there anything that really surprised you, uh, either in a positive or negative way? Was there anything that kind of I mean, uh, blew the, away your expectations? So when I first heard about the... Uh, the poise mechanic, mm-hmm. like the idea of wearing down an opponent to like break their guard kind of thing and finish them off. I was somewhat skeptical. I was like, I don't know about this. This is because it's so different from what I was used to. Right. But then I really ended up loving it. The more I went through it, I was like, oh, it's going to be fighting. Like, are they going to let me fight multiple guys at one time? How's this going to work? Like flow well. Right. But I was pleased with how it all came together at the end, I would say. Cool. Um, the combat is really something that I want to focus on with both of you, um, and you kind of mentioned the the the, the clashing of swords mm-hmm. um, and how intense it was. Uh, when you compare this to something like Bloodborne or Dark Souls, are there things that you prefer or don't prefer as much? I don't necessarily prefer one of, over the other, I would say. Mm. I think the design of this game fits with the theme they're going more so of, like, ninjas and samurai fighting i think it fits very well with that when when you think back to like a souls game or bloodborne it's more just about like evading the attack i'd say like dodging is way more of a part uh right. like i don't have a i don't have a preference on either but i think the this mechanic fit very well with the theme of the game definitely uh with the souls games and with bloodborne uh i i feel like to a certain extent and not all fights were like this but a lot of times you would, ju- I would just find myself circling around enemies, fishing for that backstab, yeah. um, and you don't have to play that way. Admittedly, there are a ton of options in those games, uh, but I think it's hard when you know that something is effective not to kind of fall into a rhythm sure. with enemies, and so it can make many things feel similar. And there are a lot of times where they push you out of that comfort zone, uh, but I think for me personally, something that I like so much about Sekiro is that. I felt like I couldn't do that. Not really. I had to... Sure. It, it. I feel like Sekiro did a better job of kind of keeping me honest, and that's not always true. There are definitely bosses where I feel mm-hmm. like hitting and running is very effective. Um, but for some of the best fights in the game, it wasn't just that I had to learn their moves, but I really had to train myself. Uh, you couldn't get away with mashing. You couldn't get away with just mashing parry and hoping for the best Mm -hmm. uh when they give you those danger signals i really like that it's like no you have to react to this it's not just a trigger to get out of the way it's a trigger to get out of the way a certain way and so i really felt um more in tune with the combat and felt like i had to kind of evolve more as a player in a way that i really uh liked and Mm -hmm. the shinobi tool implementation i thought was really cool they were definitely A few times throughout Sekiro, where you have, for those of you who aren't familiar with the game, uh, as you go on, in addition to your katana, which is kind of your bread and butter, uh, you get these tools, and they can do different things. They can light dudes on fire, you can throw shuriken, you can uh, have a poison blade. Um, And they're not useful all the time, and many of them aren't useful all that often, but there were times in Sekiro where I was like, I'm going to try this, and it, it... I mm-hmm. swear it allowed me to beat a boss or a mini boss that yeah. I wouldn't otherwise uh, get to. And I think people are complaining about stealth and how easy it is to kind of clear an area. And it is, mm-hmm. especially if you get skills that uh, make it easy to do so. But even that, I think, kind of fed into its own satisfaction. I think the level design in Sekiro is kind of stunning. And. In order to like effectively clear out an area, you're doing a lot of traveling up or traveling down. A lot down. of steps yeah. and a lot of time doing it. Yeah, and it takes a lot of time, yeah. but along that journey, if you are trying to take out everyone with stealth, you'll usually find like, oh, hey, there's an item over there. How mm-hmm. do I get there? And so 
like even the cheesiest method of stealthing everything, I think, led mm-hmm. to other exploratory rewards yeah. uh, that I really liked quite a bit. It's hard not just gushing about this game. I've I've had a few days to let it settle a little bit, and I feel just as strongly about it, if not more strongly about it, uh, than I have. But Brandon. When it comes to to nitpicking, you famously talked about the lips not moving in Bloodborne, and I believe Ian yeah. has kind of held a grudge uh, <laughs> about that with you over time. Uh, it's become kind of a bit of a joke, I would say. But in Sekiro, the storytelling is a lot different. I don't want to spoil the story, but I think right. we can talk about the fact that you are a character. You are a named character who has a voice and a personality. Um, the storytelling, I would say, is a little bit more direct uh, than it's been in the past. Not that it doesn't have its own arcane elements, um, but how do you feel about it? Do you care? Are you engaged? Do you want to see what happens with these characters? Um, this might seem like a tangent, but I, I just love this world so far. Mm. Man, like there's one... Uh, area very early on that you see a, a a home that is on fire. Yeah, it is very very far in the distance, and you get there. And I I, I just felt that like in the in the previous games, uh, like in all of the Souls games, especially Bloodborne, like these are very stark affecting environments. Um, yeah. But it was tough for me, uh, especially uh, in, in Bloodborne is probably the best example because that was a game I like you know put my heart into. I like played that game a lot. I did New Game Plus twice in a row. Right, and. I enjoyed the story, but I didn't really get into it. All just kind of felt like a dream, and I know it's it's a dream, but like yeah. uh, it was tough for me to when I would go up to a door and somebody would be like, "No, I'm not coming out." Uh, I'm gonna be you know during the the nightmare or the calling yeah. or I don't know what they the call hunt. it, like the, the hunt. hunt. Like I'm gonna stay indoors, and it's like aside from this door and the voice on the other side of it, like it's hard for me to believe somebody actually lives here. You know, like that this is actually like a neighborhood mm-hmm. where people coexist. Yeah, and like definitely get that vibe from Sekiro, and I'm loving it. Like, yeah. uh, they do such a good job with you really looking around and seeing like how destroyed these areas are. And um, it's interesting how when you have the grappling hooks of some bosses will limit you that way, where like you you can see where you can go, it's just the grapple isn't activated yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just, I love the environment. I love where people are. Um, I just think it's so much more affecting for me to like meet those characters when I find them. And it's, I don't get the sense like Bloodborne where it's just like, the story is cool. Excuse me. but uh, I don't know. I don't necessarily buy the world that they're living in. I love the way it looks. I mean, it's gorgeous. Yeah. But it just wasn't necessarily meshing for me. And uh, this this game just kind of has everything I love that I have come to love about Souls from my experience with it, or from software games, mm-hmm. where uh, I just think the, the the combat, the skills that I have, the supernatural elements, uh, or, or and just the realistic, almost like historical elements that they call upon, just all seems to really gel very well. Yeah. And um, I'm. Much more focused on the combat right now. Like that's, the, the, I, I'm definitely not. I don't think I've absorbed like a ton of story to really like get a sense completely what's going on. Yeah, love the eavesdropping. Yeah, that's really cool. I love the, the 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 sound. I love how quiet that is, and um, and it's great to you know get like a a tease of a boss coming up or like a hint at how to get through someplace. Um, and I think really my my favorite thing about again kind of off topic, but. Uh, about the world is just to, how you navigate it. Like mm-hmm. the fact that I realized like, oh, I can just skip this boss. Right. Like when I engage this boss, I'm trapped in that zone. But if I want to just sneak past them, I can move move on. And that's really interesting when, um, because like when I would be playing Bloodborne and I would like, you just do a lot of running. If you're like, okay, I want to run past all these things. I know I'm going to startle them, but they're not going to get an attack in because by the time they do, I'm going to be 10 feet away. Yeah. Where just, you know, zipping past them and, and, and grappling everywhere feels so good. Yeah, uh, Brandon, I think that's a really good point to bring up where I, I have enjoyed uh, the level design of Miyazaki's past work with the series, but actually getting around them mm-hmm. uh, hasn't been that enjoyable, like the, the process of moving, like finding how things connect yeah. or later on, later on top of each other, or finding secrets is going to be great. But here I feel like the simple act of getting from place to place kind of gets me more into with the character, especially because it's not like you're fighting a bunch of things that can also do it. It's an mm-hmm. advantage that you have. It is a yeah. way that you've trained. It is part of your character. Uh, you are a shinobi, and it's really satisfying because something else that I really like about this game is I feel like uh, in, in other Soulsborne games, and this is, I'm not saying this is a Soulsborne game, but I, I feel like it, it, it helps comparing to kind of highlight what this game does well. Uh, running away is not always the most viable. There's definitely times I can think of in, in past 
Soulsborne games where I would try to want to run away, but it just like the area that I was in was super limiting or the thing was so big or so fast that I just couldn't really do it. That's not always the case, but here I feel like running away is kind of a great moment where you just find something, you get your ass handed to you, and you just like frantically pan the camera up and look for a grapple hook, yeah. and you grapple away, and you just kind of have that moment where you're catching your breath, and the thing is just on the ground, and you're up above him, and you're just staring at each other. Um, and I I love that. I think it, it makes... There's so much, like, whatever you're doing in this game, whether you're exploring and finding, like, oh, if I look up, I can actually grab onto this thing, get a secret, or if you run away to catch your breath, or you're actually in a fight and you get a bunch of uh, parries in a row, like, it it has a lot of the great things of past Soulsborne games, like shortcuts and secrets and tough enemies, but I never felt like it was just repeating the same things. Right, it right. really oh, yeah. uh, feels like its own distinct thing. It doesn't just feel like an iteration. It feels like a step forward in a different and meaningful mm -hmm. direction. Like everything that they did, I feel like has a strong purpose. Yeah, I think it was wise to drift away from the more Souls formula. Because mm -hmm. like I love all the Dark Souls Bloodborne games, but a after Dark Souls 3, when I finished it, I was like, okay, I'm good for a little bit. Like right. I... As, so like as you go through a Souls game, I talk about this in the review. Um, you cut like it's a new game, but you kind of know what to expect. You feel right. like you can kind of feel the vibe of what's gonna happen, stuff like that. When you play, when I played Sekiro the first time, I felt way more just like I don't know what's gonna happen. I gotta figure all this out right now. I'm totally out of my element. I gotta approach things differently than I ever did. Yeah. So for someone who's been playing the games for a long time, I was very happy they tried something like really different. Like yeah. there's definitely things that are familiar. Yeah. Like you're like okay, yeah, of course, but there, it's different enough. Where I was like, this feels exciting again. Made me a kind of thing when I played Demon Souls the first time, just kind sure. of like wonderment and figuring things out, stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, the Thing I think Dark Souls 3 is such an interesting game because I, I love it. Uh, but there were definitely moments where Dark Souls 3 kind of felt like a greatest hits of of Souls. <clears throat> and I was like, oh, okay, like we're doing a dragon again. Like it's cool <laughs> yeah. and you did it well, yeah. but we're doing that again. Sure. Or we're doing a big, you're going to move really slowly through this poison. And it's like, yeah. okay, cool. Like because this is the last Souls game, at least for the foreseeable future, uh, that makes sense, but I think what impresses me so much about Sekiro is there are things I can point to in Demon Souls and Dark Souls 1 and Dark Souls 2 and Bloodborne and Dark Souls 3 where I'm like, ah, I didn't really like that boss or yeah. that area didn't really gel for me. Uh, I think in Sekiro what I'm so impressed by is just kind of the efficiency of every area. Like every area <sighs> I feel like is testing you in a slightly different way. The bosses are testing you in a slightly different way. I would argue that they even do kind of big set piece moments. Uh, really effectively, more effectively than they've done so in the past. Yep. I thought kind of more of the gimmicky fights were were more thought out, more effective, oh, more fun, yeah, more. and more brief. Uh, nothing in Sekiro really felt too long or too drawn out. Yeah. And I, I felt like from the beginning of the game all the way to the end, mm -hmm. uh, I was getting consistently surprised, yeah, which I definitely. really, really liked. Um, Brandon, I want to talk to you about progression, something really yeah. uh, that people really enjoy about... Uh, the Souls games that's not present here is uh, making different builds. So when you level up, you get to right. increase your stats. Um, and those stats inform what you can use, what spells you can cast, what weapons you can use, and so on. That doesn't work that way here. Yeah. Uh, if you find something, you can use it. Um, and you do level up, but it's it's more about this skill system where uh, that experience you apply to different skill trees and you get different abilities or different passives. Uh, how did you feel about that within the context of the game? Uh, I'm really funny because I loved we had, you know, Corey on to talk about God of War. Mm -hmm. And he talked about open world games. We were asking what he was playing this year. And he was like, he's like, I'm not a big fan of open world games because... Uh, I feel it's like a to-do list. You know, like I, I look at the map and I see all these places I have to go. I'm the complete opposite. I love, I, I see some new place and it's like, I can't wait to go there, see what's there, discover it. And I kind of feel that way about a to-do list when I play games like this, where like yeah. an ability comes up or I'll get an item that will, you know, increase my damage or defense or, um, you know, my uh, resistance to poison or whatnot. And I'm just thinking like, should I use it? Should mm -hmm. I save it? When, when do I use that? Am I doing this right? You know, like, and... Uh, I, I have that fear with Sekiro, but like so far, I, I don't think there's anything 
specifically there was like one move that you and Hubert enlightened me like mm-hmm. how to use yeah. you know correctly but it, again it was it was on a, a a adversary that I was able to sneak past and was like maybe I don't need to go back and fight that person like you do get benefits like when you take down anyone with a name anytime like you get blocked off in an area like it's you're probably gonna want to take the time to master that you know mm-hmm. that, that fight and take that person down because you'll reap the rewards right um, but yeah I can't really speak to how different it is because you know, having just tried Soul, you know, Dark Souls 1 for a little bit and then moving on to, you know, Bloodborne and now moving on to this, it's just always been different. I've right. always had to just master some system. And I was a little nervous right off the bat because I love grinding. I mm-hmm. have no problem doing that in any RPG or action game. And I was like, oh, I don't know if I can necessarily do that. And you can't do it in the way uh, that you might specifically expect. like, you know, number right. by number within Bloodborne. Um, but uh, I'm still having a, a ball mm-hmm. going through. It's really interesting having just a straight half money gone. You know, it's like yeah. there's no going back. You know, like I remember like being like, okay, I'll, you know, like, I, I instinctively did that the first time I got taken out, like went back to that area. It was like, where's the, what? Yep. Yeah, the whole <laughs> tool tip came up like it's gone. Mm-hmm. There's no, you know, just don't die next time you go through there. Um, uh, Brad, that's actually one of the, the biggest complaints I've seen about Sekiro, that, mm-hmm. that people really miss that variety um, and sure. kind of that, that, that sense of, of playing the wrong way, whereas not that there isn't variety in Sekiro, right. there absolutely is. There are a ton of tools and skills that you can get, uh, but it is more like this is your main weapon and yeah. you have to learn uh, to play a certain way to a certain extent. How did it play off for you? Uh, I was all for it because <clears throat> I've done that so many times yeah but now that they gave me they gave me like a much more focused kind of uh combat system how they want me to play and i Mm -hmm. thought the system itself was so intriguing and interesting it has so much depth and it has such a high skill cap i like never got bored of it yeah and i feel like the ninja tools are the that's like kind of their answer to that yeah the ninja tools are super useful they are i feel like i'd they're, they they could change a fight dramatically just by using a certain tool, and I think that really helps. But I, I understand how people are like, oh, I want to use a spear the whole game. Like, that's fine. Right. But this game just isn't built around that system. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's it's hard to say this definitively because some of my favorite fights are in the Soulsborne games, and I can point to Bloodborne fights right now yeah. that, that still hold up and are still incredible. Uh, but I do think kind of what I was talking about earlier where, like, every one of those games had fights that, like, didn't really quite work for me, and you, you think about it, and it's like, okay, well, the more variety that you give... I think the harder it is to make every single thing in the game, be it an environment or a boss, yeah, exactly. feel super, super tight. And there are especially some one-on-one versus a humanoid fights in Sekiro where it's just like the speed at which things are unfolding, like how many attacks they get in, the the, the small windows where you can counterattack. Like it's really, they just turn it so mm-hmm. tight that it's like this blisteringly fast duel. And it's like... Yes, like the, the the dexterity required here, I think, mm-hmm. like makes it so adrenaline pumping and fun that I'm totally okay with just using this katana yeah. the rest of the game because I feel like it it's saying, hey, we're only going to give you this main weapon, but we're going to make sure the we're going to make it killing. really awesome and fun doing right, it. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, but I like you could agree. change stuff up, like your attack. You can have different attacks and stuff yeah. like that. So like, there is room for experimentation, but it's it's just probably not what people who played Souls games maybe want, right? Which is fine. Like I'm totally cool with like people wanting that. But to me, this game is just not that game, right? And it's not trying to be that game. Yeah, um, and I I kind of mentioned this before, but I do want to reiterate because I think it's a, another huge quality and it's kind of made me think differently mm-hmm. uh, about about games and, and skills. Uh, I feel like in a lot of games, in, in different genres, it could be true in shooters or RPGs or whatever, there are a lot of times where you kind of get a skill and it's like, okay, well, now I'm just going to use this from here on out. Mm-hmm. Um, and what I really enjoy about Sekiro is so many of the things, whether it was the Shinobi tools or new combat arts or whatever they were, it was like, you're going to use this every once in a while, and we're not going to make it super clear when it can be best used. And I love that because it 
I feel like there were fights where I would get my ass handed to me and I would have this moment and it seems so obvious in retrospect, like, oh, of course you do that. But I felt so good being like, oh, I'm going to try this. I'm going to try this tool that like has been good in specific situations, but I'm going to try it here when they do this attack or this combat or whatever it is and have it work out. Um, And... I, I love that. There was never a moment where I got something and was like, okay, well, now every fight is easier. I know. Like, yeah. I didn't stick Except with... Except for, like, stealth stuff. I didn't... Like, I had some weapons that were my favorites, but I didn't stick with mm-hmm. a single, like, the same three weapons the entire playthrough. Yeah. I was always changing stuff out because it was... Some weapons were better in certain situations. Like, uh, you told me about a boss fight you used a specific tool on, right? right? Like, yeah. I didn't even think about that. I was like, oh, that's so cool. Yeah, and I, I love the... The, uh... The system with that, because the boss that I was talking about, it's an in-game boss, so I'm not going to yeah. ruin it, but it's not like, so this boss had multiple phases, and it's not like, because I figured this out, I could just get the boss done. It's like, okay, I have mm-hmm. to get all the way to the final phase, and then I can use it, and the amount of, basically, ammunition, these talismans that you consume when you yeah. use the tools, I can only do it a couple of times, and i got to make sure that I nail it. And so, even when you find that weakness, even when you find that thing that works, it's not like just, okay, do this Easy, and you win. Yeah. It's like, okay... Think about how to use this, when to use it. It'll give you a slight advantage, and you'll still feel like you climbed a mountain. Yeah, and I used a completely different tool than you did on that fight. To, like, oh, I had, like, we'll have to talk about I'd, that I'd, later. I talked about it to you earlier, but I used a different like a different ninja tool in the fight and just in a different way than you did for me to get through it. Yeah. But I was just like, oh, Ben, use that way. And I, I went about this a completely different way than you did. Sure. Um, I want to talk about another another. I don't know if it's fair to say controversial, but another very talked about aspect yeah, sure. of of Sekiro is dragon rot. <laughs> so right. the more that you die, uh, the more that people within your world get sick. No pressure. Yeah, um, and I'm like sorry, everybody. <laughs> right when you die, uh, you lose experience and money, uh, half of it to be exact, and. Yeah, it's 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 kind of a, a guilt mechanism when you go back to kind of your hub and <laughs> you talk to somebody and they're coughing and they're ta- they're coughing because of you. Uh, Brandon, how did you feel about this punishment? I love bringing that up with Brad because I was like, I was like, what's his name? The guy who's coughing. And Brad's like, well, he shouldn't be coughing technically. I was like, oh, sorry, Brad. Sorry, I'm not <laughs> living up to your expectations. Um, yeah, it's it's one of those systems that I haven't. It, it's interesting because it's a lot of uh, how. A, someone like me who doesn't have a lot of experience with this fr- the, the, this franchise, this developer, and all the games that they've made, where I got to be honest, like I'm just kind of rushing through this game. Not rushing, but like I'm kind of just taking this game as it challenges me. Mm-hmm. And so when it introduces a system, like I don't necessarily feel the need to like completely understand that right away. Like if there's some kind of thing that's going to hurt me, the more I die, it's not like I'm going to intentionally die less. <laughs> you right. know? It's just like, yeah. um, but I I love the idea that. Um, you know, kind of like the, the the curses and how they talk about that in in uh, in Bloodborne, and you getting a sense of you know what these enemies used to be like, and kind of you know what happened, like the the big like blobs in the uh, the school that you see later, just like wandering around the halls, like like these used to be people, like this was a condition that happened to them. Um, it's interesting having that emotional connection because you don't really have many like friends in this world. At least I haven't encountered any. Like there are people that will help you because of what you're doing, but right. uh, um, you, there's, there's not a lot of strong bonds that you develop. And so it's interesting having that uh, not only be something that I feel bad, you know, like it's a very visceral uh, apologies if I'm doing that to somebody listening to this podcast by coughing and sneezing, but like yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's just undeniably it, it, like just the word dragon rod is such a terrible thing when you think about. Um, and uh, um, when, yeah, you die like four times and that, thing pops up you're just like great insult yeah. to injury <laughs> yeah um so i like it I, I think it's i think it's something that you can be aware of and something that you can can uh that's really defined but like can can encourage you to play better but as somebody who is gonna have a very hard time getting through and finishing this game which i very much want to do it's not like holding me back i'm not angry at it yeah. you know i've never been like you know um it's never hurt my stats and i've been like this is just completely unfair right you know, the, the main thing for me is that, you know, every time I get taken out, I know it's going to be another, you know, six minutes before I even get back to the opportunity to fight this boss again or sure. get past this area. What did you think of it, Brad? Uh, the dragon rot aspect? Yes. I don't think it's that severe, the yes. actual thing of dragon rot, because I feel like the, because you can resurrect, you get a free jail, get out of jail card for almost any yeah. situation, except maybe a boss fight. And it's it's so 
cool that you can strategically use the resurrect, yeah, like have can, people walk away, yeah. sneak resurrect, up on and then stealth kill them. It just feels so amazing to do. Sorry. As far as I'm aware, I don't believe the Dragon Rods kills any NPCs. I haven't seen any die yet. I mean, I could be wrong, but I haven't ran into that. Yeah. So it's like not that big of a deal to me because I'm I could usually prepare pretty well if like I'm gonna die. I'm like okay, I know when I'm gonna do this. Right. Because when you die and you lose your XP, you don't lose a skill point if you have one. So if I'm like really close to skill point, maybe I'll just get it if I think I'm gonna die. Yeah. Then I don't have to worry about dying. Like money's not that hard to get in this game, so it's never really been a big, like a big hurdle for me where I feel like oh man I've got dragon rods like. I'll just get Dragon Rot later because I want to talk to some PC when he's not sick or something like that. Sure, yeah. Uh, it was a thing where the, the more I, I felt about it, the more I appreciated it. And I think the better understanding you have of it, uh, the better you kind of feel about it. Because in in other From Software, in, in Souls games, there would be times where the more you die, the less health that you have. Yeah. And that can be really anxiety inducing because it's like, oh man, I keep getting my ass kicked. And like now I am statistically increasingly at a disadvantage when I go up against this just because I keep losing health. And there are ways to recover that, of course. Um, but here, you don't really have that statistical disadvantage. Um, and when we kind of pair this with the way that we were talking about skills, where it's like, yeah, they're useful, but in most circumstances, it's really your bread and butter combat that's right. going to get you through a situation. Um it's it's something that like, you feel it when you when you go and you go to get the you go and you back to your home base and you're like I have no money or experience because I died a bunch like it feels bad mm -hmm. but it never feels limiting it never feels like it is taking the game away from you and beating you with a stick and being like you can't yeah. go yeah, it, forward anymore. It doesn't anymore. slow me down. But what I like about the dragon rot mechanic is you're right. Within the game itself, it doesn't really prevent you right. from engaging with it, prevent you from going forward, but you do feel bad. Mm -hmm. And I kind of like that psychological element to it, yeah. is when you get those those boxes that pop up and be like, this person's sick, yeah. now this person's sick. Yeah, it's, it's just letting you know. Yeah. It, it's like, it, you're, this is, there's consequences for you dying in this world. Right. It, do, it did give me uh, kind of a, a tinge of, of guilt. Mm -hmm. um, not so much that it really made me be like, ah, oh, man, fuck this game. I'm not going to keep <laughs> playing right but uh it was it was there and so it felt like a really careful balance um but the other thing that i want to say is that's so important uh and I, we won't go into specifics but i do love how core mechanics for death the resurrection you can resurrect multiple times yeah. um and the dragon rot are not just things that are there they're not just mechanics they do have narrative relevance yeah. and kind of exploring that uh, I think goes a long way in making the the game feel very cohesive. Oh yeah, it made to me it made me feel like the power I had resurrection like extremely special. Yes, because like people in the beginning of the game make it known they want that power and right. stuff like that. So right. I thought it was awesome how it tied in with that. Right, like this has a heavy consequence. This is why they don't want people to have it because it spreads this disease and stuff like that. Yeah, and I, I think it's it's touches like that that make you not just like play through these games like oh yeah I'm gonna get see credits but really make you obsessed in in such a positive way is because they go that that extra mile mm -hmm. um there's a training dummy in this game yes. which is a which is a new thing <laughs> but it's not just like this wooden target that you go and beat up on he's a person With his own he has story. his own story he has his own things that that, yeah. go, that go on and i think because of that i was like oh i want to know what's going to happen to my training dummy mm -hmm. um and i think just that level of of commitment to every single element in the game really makes it special that makes me eyes. think of um the tutorials in the game I feel like they go right. out of their way more than any other game they've made to tell you how things work in this game. They do. They do go out of their way. And it's it's hard. I'm doubting myself a little bit because in retrospect, I'm like, yeah, I don't think anything was super unclear sure. uh, or anything major was super unclear. Um, but Brandon, you're kind of still yeah. uh, going through the game. Have you found those tutorials intrusive, helpful? Do you feel like you have a grasp of what's going on? Yep, there's just one. There's this one ability, and again, it hasn't, it didn't, you know, you know, stick my progress. Like I was able, like I said, just to kind of move past that boss. Mm -hmm. I got one little jerk that I want to go back now that I yeah. now that I know specifically how an ability works. The yeah. I think I think we can talk about that. It's yeah, like it's some a Fury counter. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's a thing to help you counter spear users. Right. I don't the, think it's super. The spoiling. beautiful thing is too, Brandon, is you could practice that on the guy. 
So you can put a how do you put a spear in his hands? So he, it's, it's like, just any thrust attack. It doesn't have to be a spear. Oh. The way that he works is you kind of you got to go through his training, and then right. as you go through it, more things. Yeah, will you open unlock, up. and you be like, oh, I want to practice this specific part of oh, combat. Okay. Cool, cool. Uh, question for you, Brandon. Sometimes when we uh, talk about skills like that that are so useful in so many situations, right. like uh, let's say uh, another random game, they're like, oh, I get the ability to jump now. I wish I had that in the beginning. Right. Do you feel like that skill is so essential that you wish you kind of had it by default? Like, of course, everybody should get this, or do you think it is fair the way Sekiro presented it? Oh, I think it's totally fair. And like you were talking about uh, the money's not hard mm-hmm. to get. I don't think experience is hard to get mm-hmm. either. Like, I think... You know, you can uh, follow a critical path through the skill trees if you want to focus on one specific thing. But if you need to stop, if you're like, okay, I don't have, because I think I I went one way in- instead of that other way with the Makiri counter, and mm-hmm. I saw that was like, okay, I need that. So I'm like, I'm just gonna run through this area a couple times and and level up and then buy it and then, and then sure. Give it a yeah, shot. it's like one of the first things in the tree, if not the first thing. Yeah, I think it. You get two options, and that's one of them. Yeah, if it's, I remember and it's like correctly. one skill point. It is interesting they make you unlock it though when it's like such a core mechanic. I feel like of the game. Yeah, but it's so easy to get at the same time. Yeah, yeah it is. Um, I've enjoyed filling out that skill tree. Yeah, at no point have I been like, oh, this ability is so far away. Uh, I, I, I get a mm-hmm. kick out of it. And there's a lot of stuff. And there even, is, even just having, stuff. I think, probably like four or five hours in the game. Yes. A, a lot of stuff to unlock. There are definitely some skills that I was excited about, and then I was like, ah, <laughs> I don't want to use this, mm-hmm. or skills that I didn't think were that exciting, although they were useful, uh, such as getting more, like, talisman, ammunition. Yeah. Um, like... Doesn't sound exciting, but useful. <laughs> yes, it is. It's very useful. And so that can be a tricky balance. One mm-hmm. thing that I like that the game does well is there would be a lot of moments where I was like, do I want to spend one or two skill points now yeah, totally. or save up for five? And I yep. think that's always a cool decision. Yeah, that is cool. Um, Brad, yes. we've been talking about Sekiro for about 40 minutes, a little that's less right. than that. Um and so, unfortunately, I don't think we could spend the whole two and a half, <laughs> however long this episode, this, this episode <sighs> ends up being about Sekiro. And we're going to talk about it more uh, in the future, I'm sure. Uh, but a question I wanted to throw at you. I've also seen complaints uh, that the enemies aren't very smart, that once you kind of figure out stealth, um, they get pretty easy to take care of. And mm-hmm. there are skills that enhance yourself even further. Um, do you think that just... Enemy AI in regards to stealth, it's a little bit too easy, a little too straightforward, a little uh, too dumb. Kind of. On some, on like, I would say most of the enemies, it's pretty easy. There's mm. definitely like situations where it's not as easy, and some enemies, you can't just cheese with stealth all the way. You can't just backstab and run away and then come back and do it again. They're dead. They, they right. respawn their health, some stuff like that. To me, like stealth in games, most of the time, like stealth is a huge element of this game, but I wouldn't say it's a stealth game. Mm-hmm. So to me, it's not the main focus, but I think for how much you could do, it's pretty decent, sure. pretty decent. Sure. There is moments where I was like, mm, how could they see me? Why are they seeing me? Why aren't they seeing me right here? Right. Mm-hmm. But I think it's pretty good overall. Because uh, like, even in the old Souls games, I could cheese enemies pretty yeah. easily. Like They all have a leash. They stop and they start walking back real slow or turn around. To me, it's like the same kind of thing, except I don't have to waste my time as much doing it if I want to. Yeah, to me, it's it's all about the push and pull, and mm-hmm. I think that's something that other Souls games have, have done well, and I think Sekiro does it, man, maybe the best, uh, where I would definitely have moments, and you had the same moment, I thought it was funny when you brought it up, early on, I like grabbed onto a ledge, and there was no way this person could see me, but somehow like the AI triggered it, and I was like, ah, that wasn't yeah. very cool, and then there were plenty of other moments where I was like, how aren't they seeing me? I feel like right. I'm being so obvious. Um, but what I mean by push and pull is if I was getting frustrated by how far away they could see me or the way enemies were placed, there are items in the game that can help, consumable items that could help you out and skills that you can get where I felt like I could, the game was providing me options to get through those situations as long as I was willing to commit to them or think about them or remember, remember them. So that was really great. And the other thing is, like, yeah, definitely there are areas where I had I, I annihilated everyone with stealth. I cleared out an entire area with stealth, and that felt very powerful. But it wasn't just, like, something where I could do it brainlessly. It was mm-hmm. like, oh, right. 
oh, it's a good thing that I took the high ground because I wouldn't have seen this person hiding behind this thing. Yeah. Or they're positioned in such a way where, like, this guy's hidden in the back, so if we go for the guy in the center, he will right. definitely see you. And so you do have to apply some method to it. And even if you are a stealth god and you're just clearing out every single area, there are boss fights and many boss fights where you just can't do that. Yeah, yeah. You gotta, you gotta be decent at the combat yeah. to get through it. And so... I, I felt like that mix. Uh, yeah. It was like I could never rely on just one the tactic game to get through. The lets you have fun with stealth if you want for oh, a bit, yeah. but sometimes right. it's like, uh-uh. Right, This right. is not going to work here. Anymore. It's really oh. gratifying <laughs> when you're trying to get from point A to point B. You know exactly where you need to go. I need to get back to this po- spot to take on this boss or fight right. this, this enemy type. And it's fun to get through it. It's right. fun to, you're like, I know I can zip, zip, zip over to this spot. I know I'm going to take that guy out, freak out the guy next to him, engage in combat take him out because even sometimes it takes a little bit for when when you'll take out somebody's friend and they're like oh and you yeah. just get a couple like hits it yeah. on him easy um yeah it's just it's the kind of thing where like i recognize this was not as elaborate as like a lot of stealth games that i played and i really really love the genre um like enemies like, literally have to like almost like bump directly into a corpse to be like whoa <laughs> yeah, 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 like, yeah they'll yeah. notice somebody they get over it super quick there's no change to their AI once they recognize someone they're not like on alert yeah um, but at the same time you'll have someone uh, there was one boss it was in an area where there's just like a little monster dude up in the corner that kind of remind me of like a the bell maidens or whatever from mm-hmm. Bloodborne where they're gonna make things very difficult if that person sees me they're gonna alert everybody yeah and so it's so gratifying not to just like bloodborne style run all the way up to that staircase to get to them like I can kill that person first right. <laughs> you know I can like go out of my way to get there um, and so yeah I think and it, what's interesting is I remember going back through and playing bloodborne like something for example it's funny that there's like you know evil roosters in like both games there's like <laughs> evil birds in bloodborne and evil birds yeah, in uh, Sekiro <laughs> yeah and there would be an area where like they'd all be waiting, but if I run through it in Bloodborne, they would all just freak out, but they wouldn't attack me. And so Bloodborne is trying to scare you so much that that would kind of take the teeth away a little bit from some of those moments. And it's just like, I'm not really afraid of that enemy type anymore. Right. And even if like those big dudes with the hammers, even if I stealth kill one of those, I'm still terrified of those things. Mm -hmm. And so it's really gratifying to get that stealth kill and then get away if I want to slowly, you know, pick an area apart. It's really gratifying. I don't feel yeah. like, okay, I'm not scared of these things anymore. Right. Or the, the world doesn't seem believable to me. It's like, that felt great. You know, sneaking well, in. Well, because there's always a sense of danger. Like, oh, yeah. even when you're just clearing out an and, area. Yeah. Like, something can go wrong yeah. real fast. And if you mess the stealth up. Yeah. They, you know, those people, like the 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 people with rifles and arrows and cannons. And, like, they're relentless. Like, right. they, you know, you, you have to know where those guys are. The... Uh, this is more of a, a personal preference than anything else, but I, I, uh, I'm i thinking about Bloodborne specifically, and there are those giant pigs that you mm-hmm. can sneak up on. And a lot of times I felt like in Bloodborne when I had to sneak up, it's just like, okay, I have to move so slowly, and it would take a long time. I love just in Sekiro being like, I'm going to zip up there, I'm going to jump down there, and you're dead. Just yep. kind of the immediacy of it was very satisfying. Mm-hmm. I have to tell you a quick Bloodworth anecdote. Uh, you mentioned the, the giant roosters in the yeah. game, and I was playing Sekiro... Uh, in between shoots and he just came in and was watching and he said wow they really nailed the sound of that rooster games really struggle with that and I was like what a what a great interesting unique Bloodworth comment that Mm -hmm. was it's like oh yeah it's a good sound it's a good sound and (laughs) I mean but that's a good point I think with Sekiro is it feels like a game everybody's going to play a little bit differently. Yeah. You know, like someone who's a big Batman nerd like me, it's just that that first time, I was like, oh, man, I'm doing that just nonstop. Mm -hmm. So good to just chain those things when you know where to go. I'll even go out of my way to just loop five of them when I really only know to do two. I only have to do two to get up to that rooftop. But it's like, hey, it's there. I'm just going to make the rounds. Um, Man, it was was such a satisfying feeling uh, finishing the game, and I was just so happy with that accomplishment and then i go on twitch and people are like yeah i'm doing a no healing run or on youtube and somebody beat it in like an hour and eight minutes Always, and dude. i was like you assholes yeah every time <laughs> game, dude. came out what are you a few do? days ago super nitpicky nonsense yeah uh i'm not a fan that there's a super loud clanging noise when you stealth kill <laughs> oh the <laughs> boom yeah, yeah. sure I, I like that sound a lot it's i a, see where you're I mean, coming it, from it's but. gratifying but it's it's just it's weird when someone's 10 feet away and they yeah. you know Kong! when you do it and the person's like oh, what was that and you're like uh you didn't hear that <laughs> maybe it's just because it was stuck in my head but i i was playing 
Sekiro on such long intervals that I would stop and I'd be like in the car or something and I could hear the battle music and just <laughs> with the battle music that was stuck in my head, the clanging of swords. Mm-hmm. And I was like, this is awesome. Like, those are some really great sounds that are happening. Like, uh, it sounds game. super dumb, but Swords Clash of the game is like the coolest oh, thing oh, ever. Yeah, it is. Oh, yeah, like when you're just, just having like, like a, this, when you're having a rally time. with like an enemy, it oh, is yeah. awesome. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. All right, I want to go to the complete opposite end of Sekiro. I think I think about as far away from Sekiro as you can get. And I want to talk about Yoshi's Crafted World. Woo! I'm stoked to play this. Yeah, okay, so I, I got this at... <laughs> I was really excited about Yoshi's Crafted World because I was like, this will just be the chillest thing ever. Um, and I really wasn't... My, my expectations were low, not necessarily in a bad way, but I was just like, I know what I'm getting into, and it's fine. I don't need to think about it too much. Dude, same here. And I have to say, um, this game exceeded my expectations. So I thought uh, the most recent Kirby game on Switch was fine, but a little... N- there wasn't enough that really wowed me, um, and I was playing Yoshi's World, Worldly World not that long ago, and it was good, um, but... With Kirby's Epic Yarn and this, not that it wasn't cool or didn't have good levels or good ideas, but it, it felt like kind of, this is the Yoshi version of this idea. Oh, 100%. Yeah. With Crafted World, there's a lot more of an identity here than I was expecting. Um, and I think from the games that I just mentioned, it has the best level design uh, of any of them. And the reason that I say that is it really takes advantage of this whole Crafted World concept. Um, but it takes advantage of it in a way that feels very, very fast. Um, so you'll be going along, and there'll be boxes that you can smash, or there'll be houses that you can tumble down. Um, but what's really cool is once you finish a level, because it's a, a crafted world, you'll have this flip side challenge where you'll go through the level starting from the end and getting to see these things that are built in the world from another perspective is really, really great, and it goes out of its way. So these these worlds that you're going to, there are a bunch of them, and pretty early on, you can choose multiple paths, so you feel like you have a lot of freedom mm. immediately, and depending on where you go, it feels like there's a huge new idea that they explore. So on one level, you might be on a plane, and you ha- might have to shoot targets in the sky, or another one, you put on a like dinosaur skull, and now mm. that gives you an ability to charge through things. And there's just so much going on, But what I I might love the most and might be one of the most adorable things ever, if we were to top 10 adorable things, I think this would rank very highly on the list. that's a good countdown. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So you collect coins, of course, throughout the game. And in uh, levels, there are like these gumball machines. And you can spend coins on the gumball machines to get loot. And the loot comes in rarities. So oh, there's no. common, <laughs> wow. rare, and Whoa. super rare. Whoa. But what this loot is are there different costumes for Yoshi. Oh, so <laughs> you can like there's like a like a, a can that you just put over him, or like a little cardboard car that you put on him, or uh, the super rare ones are like you get a little costume of the boss. And it's just so much fun. It's a, like you don't need them. They do give you uh, like armor. And different ones have different levels of armor, so this costume might be able to take three hits before getting crushed. Mm. And even if it gets crushed, you you just don't have it for that level, but you can go back and re-equip it later. Um, But like a super rare one, you might be able to take four hits or five hits or whatever it is. Um, And so it's really fun getting these costumes. You feel like you're getting all of these coins. You're getting thousands and thousands of coins, uh, but you actually have a reason to use them. And sometimes you're like, "Ah, I don't really like the costumes in this area. I'm going to save up and wait until I get to the next area to see what I can put Yoshi in. It's like Mario Odyssey. Yeah, and like you can see where the super rare one is on the gumball machine. So you're like, oh, it's really close. Do I go for it now? Um, And it's just such a clever idea that fits this, like, crafted aesthetic so well and makes uh, progression and item hunting uh, that much more satisfying nice. as well. Um, and the way that you unlock like boss areas or new worlds is by spending flowers that you get in the one of the classic Yoshi flowers. Um, and it's really easy to get them and it's really easy to have enough to get through. But because you know those checkpoints are coming, uh, you do want to go out of your way to get as many as possible. And so, yeah, it's it's really, really fun. And it's, it's of course, a very easy game. Yeah. It's not something that you're going to be struggling with. 
Um, but I think the ideas are there, and there's actually enough challenge in... It's actually pretty difficult to 100% a world, hmm. where there's so many different things to collect, so many conditions to fulfill, um, that if you are trying to 100% every level, again, it's not going to be hard, but it does take enough effort that I think it's engaging and cool. interesting. And um, I just think from top to bottom, this game is really surprising me in ways that I did not expect. The, my biggest complaint with it so far is there are these guys that kind of introduce the worlds to you, and they're very jolly people. Uh, I'm sure all of you would like them. They're just little, like, little box robot guys that kind of yes. have the theme of the level on their stomach. And they'll have requests for you. So they're like, hey, go back into this level and find five cows for me or find a paper airplane for me. And uh, what's great is once you find those things, they're like, hey, you found it. Do you want to get out of this level that you've already played? Nice. And you can just immediately get out and give them the thing. So that's great. Uh, I did the first guy, and he was just – every thing that I did for him, he just gave me one flower. And it's like, well, I can get like nine of these in a new stage and you're just giving me one. And mm -hmm. I was hoping that he would give me some Something. big costume yeah. for doing all of his requests. And he just kept giving me one flower. And then he was like, I have no more requests for you. And I was like, ah, okay. Well, maybe the later guys do offer you more. I don't know. But I thought in this instance, I was like, yeah, okay, it that's wasn't a little disappointing. Yeah. It wasn't really worth it. Like I already had enough flowers. I didn't really need more. I was hoping you would give me something a little bit cooler. Again, could change with later guys, but right. I found that a little underwhelming. Brandon, you notoriously <laughs> were crushed that Yoshi was not Animal Crossing right. Switch. Right. Um, and I think, you know, don't want to put words in your mouth, so correct me if I'm wrong, that your response to it was kind of like another one of these? Like, not oh, I think, the, I think the other thing, too, was just the flipping mechanic, mm. because I remember that going as far back as uh, Paper Mario. Yeah, sure. You know, sure. and so it was like something that had been experimented before. Uh, and so it was just kind of this weird mesh of uh, Kirby's Epic Yarn and Paper Mario. And I was just like, this seems kind of like they're right. doing a lot of things that they'd done before with, with previous characters. Um, and yeah, it did not look like that difficult of a game. But it's interesting. Uh, I was actually curious if you hadn't brought it up. I was gonna uh, curious to compare it to Kirby's Star Allies. Kirby's well, there's Kirby's Star Allies, right. which is the most recent one on Switch. That yeah. one, yeah. Uh, just that people were like, this game's extremely easy, but I'm enjoying it. You know, it's really right. fun co-op. There's a lot of fun combos and fun outfits, and right. it's fun to try out new characters. And so, like, I don't necessarily need this. It's refreshing to play a game uh, that isn't like you know beating me up all the time that I can enjoy going through it. And so I was I was. Curious Curious compared to that, like, is Nintendo getting to the point where they're like, we want these franchises to be known as kind of more complicated platformers, and then these be more the games that you're going to play with loved ones, with your kids, you know, and not necessarily be as stressed out. Like you were saying, like, more complex to 100% it, but if you just want to get through it and have a good time, right. it's um, easy as well. And when you, you can actually switch at any time. When you boot it up, there's, I've only done classic mode, but there's a mellow mode where I think it's even <laughs> nice. easier to get through oh, it nice. if you nice. want it. Um, but yeah, not not to rag on Star Allies. I know there are a lot of people that like that game. It just was it just didn't float my boat right. super well. But uh, I think for me, the thing about Star Allies is it was like, okay, you're kind of introducing these concepts to me, and then I'm just going through the game. It didn't really change that much. Right. Whereas here, it's like, okay, now I just have to be super observant and pick out these targets while I'm on a moving train, or I have to run away from a dinosaur that's very similar to, like, the first boss of Metal Slug 3. I, like, very rarely do I feel like, oh, it's just another Yoshi uh, platforming right. thing where I, I have to rely on the same skills every single time. Um, I think just kind of its, it's restlessness with its ideas feels like... <laughs> more akin to something like Mario Odyssey where I had yeah. that idea where every world I went to I didn't know quite what I was going to expect I don't want to say this game is as good as Mario Odyssey because right. it's certainly not <laughs> but uh, yeah just definitely exceeding my expectations and I think um, this is something that people should give a look um, if they're not and it's it's funny because I really don't feel like the demo does it justice I there's a free demo out on switch and I played that and it's I believe it's the first level of the game and when I finished that demo I was like yeah this is more Yoshi <laughs> and it's funny because that level I think is far more traditional than a lot of the stuff okay. that comes later and I wish they would have done like oh I almost don't want to spoil it uh, I won't spoil it but yeah there's a level that comes later on I'm like oh I wish you would have done this this yeah. is so much more creative like, Amanda's playing that demo as we speak okay so if she was not a fan I'll go home and be like wait you know. yeah it gets better it gets wait better um, 
stick with it. It is. It like is a lot of fun discovery in the game, and, I, right. and that can go a long way, regardless of difficulty or or you know how fascinating the worlds are. Yeah. Just like I want to see what that is, or, you, or or just the joy of just like what I'm a car. What? Yeah. Like this weird car <laughs> it is. Thing on it's and, so it's so cute. It's jolly. Yeah, it's frustrating that I I don't think the demo sells the game super well. Like it's not a it's a, a terrible level or anything, but uh, that. The game is sixty dollars, and it's like, oh, I'm kind of interested in this, but I don't know. I'll wait for it to go on sale. It's like these games never rarely go on yeah, sale. Yeah, Nintendo oh, kidding me? Might be like forty dollars <sighs> ten years from now. I don't know. I do think uh, Nintendo could be a little bit better about yeah. that in some ways. But yeah, Brandon, there was a game that you were excited to talk about that we talked about last time on Frame Trap, but yeah. I now get the Brandon Ooh. Jones perspective, and that is the Division Two. Yeah, the Division Two is rad. It is. It is pretty cool, isn't it? I I can't. I played Division One, and I thought it was interesting. It seemed like a game, even something like Metal Gear Survive, which is not that great. I was like, I could probably get into this. You know, like I love, um, you know, building up turrets and stuff like that, and and building up defenses, and um, I, like I love, you know, uh, squad play. I love tactical stuff. I love cover based shooters, um, and. Just something about Division Two that just bit me like right away, <laughs> and it was crazy. Just the more and more I got into that game, the better and better it got. And I can't recall in the last like twelve months really me being like this surprised with the game. Just mm -hmm. like yes, and especially coming directly from Anthem and going into this, and just being like, okay, there's a lot of really great things about Anthem. I think just the raw like we factor of of anthem of just like yeah you're flying around i yeah. think like is instantly more attractive than division but uh there's just so many lessons that that uh, uh destiny that anthem that really anybody that's trying this model can learn from division uh and i just want to talk about two things specifically one uh the world is so great uh just in terms of how you progress and the, them, them making the areas so fascinating, whether like you're going to an area that you're like, this is the White House or this is the Capitol building or this is, you know, the the uh, um, uh, a monument that I'm, I'm familiar with, like the Washington Monument yeah. took me like six times. Yeah. I'm playing most of that game solo. And even when I get really frustrated and die and go back, it's not like, oh, this game sucks because I, it's not easy to match up with people. It's very easy. Like I love doing the jumping into random people's games. But just in terms of having as broad of a perspective as we can at Easy Allies, I'm curious to try it as, as solo as I can uh, and see. And it's just, to me, it's not a frustrating game. I love playing it solo. I love just kind of strutting through that world and exploring things. I love just running into random enemies. Um, but I think one of the things, and, and, and the sense of progression in terms of like when you get to a place and you finish it, you might go back there for a side mission. There might be, uh, I hear, uh, uh, you know, at the end of the game, they shake things up, a new enemy type comes in and you, they kind of force you to revisit some of the later areas, which logistically makes sense. You know, like it's not outside of the realms of reality to think that like if you were to clear an area and then no one's there, like bad guys are going to roll in and take it over. Like you have to like constantly, you know, be vigilant at these places. And that's so gratifying. Uh, and it's so fascinating that like, I don't get that vibe from Destiny, and I certainly don't get that vibe at all from Anthem. Like, I go to a place, and like that was fun, the abilities that I used, and the synergy that I had with my squad mates, but the area that I'm in, I don't care about at all. You right. know, like, it's it's beautiful, and there's lots of waterfalls, there's lots of like, great uh, depth and specific like um, verticality, if you will, in Anthem, but uh, it, it's amazing how just like a room, you know, walking into it and being like, you know, either like the, the messaging that's on the wall, spray paint, or getting a sense of like what happened when this, you know, uh, um, museum or hotel or uh, um, train station or whatever, like yeah. fell. You know, I love seeing like the yellow snow mm -hmm. is really interesting. I mean, not like yuck, 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 yellow snow, but like this when you have fake snow, because it was Christmas when it happened. And so you have these just really creepy, dilapidated, like Christmas vibes when you go through places. You know, it's the summer, but it's just mm -hmm. like no one's bothering to clean this place up. Um, it's just so satisfying to go through that world. And I'm only level 20. There's still like, you know, a good third of that game I haven't even visited yet. Yeah. And it's really interesting seeing a base and knowing like I am a high enough level to go into this area. I still have a lot to do in the areas that I've been to already. But it's fun to just, I'm just going to, you know, sprint through here, get to that safe house just to get it, you know, just right. so that I can go back and, and, and fast travel to that area. That that's gratifying on its own. And I can't remember any time in Destiny or any time in Anthem where I felt that way, where it was just like, no one's online. I'm not playing with anybody else. It's just fun to just go places. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's so satisfying. And the other big thing that I really, really want everybody to learn that, or everybody to take from Division 2 that's attempting this type of game is 
I get the sense um, with Destiny and with um, uh, with Anthem that like you're so important. <laughs> like you start the game and they're like you were there at this very pivotal story moment. You are one of the only few people that is taking it upon themselves to go out and fight this menace. Uh, you, if we didn't have you, all would be lost. And I love going into Division Two and they're like you're an agent. What you know? It's like just head back out there and good luck. And and I just to me. It's such an easier world to get into. And I know if you're coming up with a story, if you're trying to provide context for a world like this, it's really tempting to make you feel super special. And then, wow, what you just did was such a big deal. And to me, it's so much more realistic. And I just became immediately more immersed in the world, just judging by the fact that, like, you go into a safe house and you see other people and they're trying out, you know, right. new weapons or, <clears throat> or, or, or queuing up. And you can yeah. play the game solo or with squads. It's not that big of a deal. So I get the sense that, like, what I'm doing happens all the time, even if I do... If, have a victory somewhere it's short-lived you know you're probably going to go back at some point and it makes sense why you're going back and i think that's so important if i'm going to choose to invest in something in the long term if it's like a believable world uh that just makes it so much more interesting to me to to put in the time and be gratifying uh there's two things i want to say the first is i love how much the personalities of the allies comes out when we have them talking about the same game on frame trap because when you get huber on here and i think huber cares a lot about the same things that you do yeah. but huber's like okay i gotta tell you this dark zone story and it's like very yeah, important I'm to him whereas, whereas you you're like let me tell you about the world and and all these cool things that i saw and how it really does this effectively it's just such a different perspective that i really yeah. like quite a bit and i do want to talk about that world building really quick because i have to be honest with you i uh did not care about the people talking in Division 2 sure. very much, and the game never gave me a reason. I, I didn't, I, I can't point to a performance that I was like, ah, oh, man, you really got me, sure. or or anything that I heard over the intercom that I was like, oh, wow, what what a great delivery or line that was. So I didn't care. I, yeah. I, I kind of just tuned it out. <laughs> There's a lot of moments where they point at somebody to be like, that's Franklin. I'm like, who? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, right. A lot of that, a lot of that, just like whatever. I'm not tracking that guy. Point me the next Sorry. way. And so... Because of that, I was like, okay, I'm not going to care about this world or the story at all. And despite ignoring much of the dialogue, I still did feel really invested because of what you were saying, how unique each individual place meant. But really, the the, the settlements that you're building up, uh, really taking pride in seeing it expand or yeah. just being in there to do something like routine. And they're like, hey, check out this new thing that you gave this place. Yeah. Um, and I, I love that. And I really think it it speaks to... Uh, the Division 2, that I still found myself attached to it beyond levels and gear um, and and ignoring all of the dialogue that they had enough in there that, that, that I felt like I had ownership of. I think that's really awesome. But speaking of gear, you know, Brandon, you, you talk about MMOs, you talk about open world games. I don't really know how you feel about gear. Do you care about loot? Does loot excite uh, you? It was, yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, loot's, I mean, come on. Mm -hmm. Loot's exciting. Come on. Come on. Come Just on. Get, get good drops, feel good. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it was interesting how much experimentation I felt I was kind of forced to do in Division mm. and mm. how I didn't really care. I was just looking for that green number, baby. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> uh, I, I'm a fan of the automatic rifle. I don't like three, you know, like three burst rifles. Uh, I, I generally go with like a submachine gun or a, a automatic rifle and then like a sniper rifle or like yeah. a shotgun for uh, if somebody gets in really close. Um, but I didn't, I was never, I think the one gun I love is just one gun that fires like 900 rounds. It's just, it takes forever to reload, but you just go, 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 yeah. go, go, go. Mm -hmm. And like, love that baby. So whenever that pops up and it's relevant to my level, I'm, I'm very excited. But at the same time, it's fun to experiment. It was fun to, there was one time I had like a sniper rifle and a shotgun. That was it. And I'm like, this is very not me. This is not yeah. my play style. Um, but it's fun, especially when you're in squads. Uh, and, um. I think the abilities that you get, all these little tools, are there's so many variations of them. And it's neat that, uh, uh, I think one of the things that's most important to me when I play uh, an MMO or something that has multiple classes that are very different is you it, it if I can always tell that someone else in my crew does something and I'm like, oh, that's cool. Not cool enough for me to change my build, but cool. Yeah. You know, like one time I got taken out and I was playing with an ally. Uh, I can't remember the name, but thank you to whoever revived me. <laughs> and he just jumped into my game and uh, I got taken out and he threw like one of those bombs that just lands next to you and revives you. And oh, I was like, sweet. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. I don't think very practical to my play style. I don't see myself using that a lot, but like that moment was so cool. Mm -hmm. Cause like I found out that thing existed in the game, you know, from him using it. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I think it's an interesting game. I think it's, uh, uh, 
the way I play those in the same way that I played Anthem is like I'm not stressing myself out a ton to get like the best gear as I level up. Mm-hmm. I'm just gonna hit cap and then it begins. Then sure. it's like okay, then I'm gonna chase after those purples and, and golds and um, then then I like really want to try to you know fit something directly into my. I'm not gonna be swapping guns because you know willy nilly. I'm gonna be like no no I got my I got my submachine gun. I'm fine. Yeah, this could just be me, um, but like I found uh, semi-auto and automatic rifles to be very very good sniper rifles to be very very good light machine guns to be very very good like and those were the best like anything outside of that i was like oh whatever like i just wasn't sure. nearly as effective that could just be me um random question for you though mm. have to know uh-huh. how did you have you you've i'm assuming you've encountered the sludgehammer enemies the <laughs> yeah. guys that have a bunch of armor and can yeah, like yeah, yeah. pound you in with one hit and just yeah. take you down how do you feel about those guys uh, I don't. I, those guys didn't necessarily stand out for me. I think they're emblematic of just that game rushes you. <laughs> you yeah, know, that game mm-hmm. does not want you to stay still. Right, and it's <clears throat> it's really interesting to it kind of in a frustrating way sometimes where you're just like you don't pay attention to that wheel. You're like, wait, where? Yeah, huh? and you just turn behind you. It's three guys behind you. Um, so yeah, that wasn't that didn't that moment didn't necessarily stand out for me because that was just something I got used to of like you really especially playing by yourself like it like. I'm not throwing a turret out to necessarily do damage to a bunch of people. I'm throwing out a turret to deter them from going that direction. Right. You know, and uh, as frustrating as it is to have people spawn from one location, you drop that turret in the right spot and just it just will mow five guys mm-hmm. down at once. It's really gratifying, especially when you find a group of four people and just they're dead in eight seconds. Just wow. You just like, yeah. them all out. I love uh, sneaking up on a group that doesn't see you and yeah. just throwing a grenade and then they all die. Yeah. And just the randomness of uh, your friends. Mm-hmm. That like you just all of a sudden you'll be going to an area and like oh I got like five people just that are just here right you know? mm-hmm. and like that's really neat to uh, to to hear gunfire at a distance and be like oh is that like random player characters and it's like no it's just the world sorting itself out for sure uh, yeah Hubert complained a little bit uh, and rightfully so because he was reviewing it but uh, he was talking about the the world events not granting a whole lot you don't get a ton of XP you don't get any yeah. special items or anything yeah but uh, still for me when it's just like this guy's about to get, be executed it's like ooh it's tough to just walk away from that <laughs> you know just to be like oh well I actually always know. felt like I welcome to DC I had a lot to do which I appreciated oh, like yeah. there were times where I was like okay this isn't worth a lot of experience but mm-hmm. I, I, it's gonna be chill yeah. and so I want to do that and I appreciated yeah. having those different avenues um, in the division two, and I'm glad you brought this up because I had last time on Frame Trap, you and I had a similar conversation where combat is very active. There are enemies yeah. that get in your face and don't allow you to stay hunkered down. And just the sledgehammer guy stuck out to me so much because <laughs> there would be times where I'd be focused on something else, and then those big boys would come in and kill me in one hit. I'd be like, "You, <laughs> you." Guy. Um, and there was a moment where we were doing a stronghold, and there were, I believe, there were two of them, and like. Our, our entire like squad was terrified. We just kept backing up and backing up and backing up and backing up. And I was like, oh, what a fun moment, like taking down this yeah. crazy man. I, I like that they stagger. Like I get frustrated yeah. a lot with uh, first and third, uh, third person shooters where I'll, a guy will be sprinting from cover and I'll, I'll get in some good shots and they just, they'll take damage. Yeah. But they, it's not affecting them. And I love that they'll, they'll stumble. You know, there's grenades like doesn't do a ton of damage, but it'll shake them up for, yeah. me, for me to, for them to stay still for a second. Then I can get in a headshot or. Do you have any interest in the PvP multiplayer? Not something that I think we touched on last time outside of Dark Zone. Eventually. Yeah. Yeah. This is something that I don't, yeah, I'm not like totally interested in, but it's just, I'm just slowly chipping away at that game. So, does this have you on the hook enough that when they start rolling out big updates and 100%. new events, you're, oh, yeah. you're completely in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brand, be really I wanna, fun. I, w- I want to hit 30 by the time that raid drops for sure. It would be really fun doing the raid with you and Huber. I think we could. Uh, I agree. We could do very, very well. I do have some bad news for you, Brandon. Uh oh. Sorry to disappoint. Oh, you no. Know, no. Why do it. I do you it? Did. I do it every yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the <laughs> not only did you do it this time, not only did you say the forbidden word, but uh, they were deeply offended. Oh, they were man. like, "Get that language I'm off a, of I'm this right high now. I'm quality program." Yeah. I'm sorry. We're, we're gonna blame it on your dragon rod, I think. You said we factor, and they were just like, "No, no, <laughs> not gonna happen." Uh, for those of you who have no idea what we're talking about, we talk about uh, game impressions for a very long time, for hours sometimes, and so we just kind of take a moment in the show to take a break to play a fun game. 
game. Uh, and I really enjoyed uh, a little while ago. We talked about like crazy marketing stunts in games, and nice, I just nice. like I just like weird things that happen in games. So we're going to talk about strange celebrity appearances oh, in nice. video games. Oh, man. Excellent. It usually doesn't go over well. Um, I just did some Google searches and I pulled these from yes. Joyce Scribe and Goliath, I believe, were the names of the website. So thank you to those two places uh, for for giving me this information. But. Before we play our game, we have some wonderful sponsors Ooh. who are bringing this segment of the show to you. We, we, <laughs> we, enhancing the we factor. Our first sponsor is Greg the Dark Knight Kettering. Thank you so much, Greg. Next, we have Zotag, who says hi, allies. With the hype train for Final Fantasy XIV Shadowbringers pulling out of the station, I wanted to send out an invite to any allies on the Mattius server or Greater Aether Data Center to so join our free company or cross world link shell. Search Zotag up on Twitter at Zotag, that is X O T I G, and send him a message. Whether you're just starting out in Aorzea or have been playing for years, let's get ready for Shadowbringers together. Feels good. Feels good. Thank you, Zoteg. Next, we have JoJo's Dent Co. Really like the fifth season of JoJo, and thank you, JoJo's Dent Co. Next, I'm going to give this one to Brandon, oh. actually. Oh. Be ready. Next, we have Accounts Payable. And they, you can, thanks to Accounts Payable's generosity, you can shout out anything, anything in the world that you want. I, well, I will, it out there. I'll continue to shout out JoJo. JoJo uh, Season 1 and 2 is on Netflix. Yes. Which I've already viewed. Yeah. Uh, but I went through with the those subs there. Oh. oh. And I've gotten, really gotten those characters. And, yeah. and it was just fun to just put it on in the background. And like, I know these stories, but it was neat to. So you watched he, physical hear what media. Speed, you know, Speedwagon sounds like in Japanese. Yeah. You know? Okay. So you watched the physical media dub before? Correct. Okay. Gotcha. Did you prefer the dub or the sub? Uh, I, I think uh, probably the, the sub, but I sure. think. Uh, uh, oh, and, and full disclosure, playing Sekiro in Japanese is so good. Yeah. Play Bloodborne in English, and no regrets, but. Sekiro's death, definitely. I, like, when I booted that game, I'm a big fan of when games tell you what to do. Yes. Yeah. You boot up Sekiro, and it's like, default's Japanese. I'm like, then I will play this in Japanese, Yeah, yeah it gives sir. you confidence in picking that decision, oh, yeah. for sure. Um, I, I really, truly don't care what language someone plays Sekiro in, whether it's English or Japanese, but because I picked Japanese and I had spent so much time, like, I didn't know what the English sounded like, and so when I heard it for the first time, I was just like, that sounds wrong. Not yeah. because I was mad that the person picked that, but because it was so different. I was like, I can't I can't accept this. I'm just not and, used to it. And season one of JoJo, I think previously was my favorite because it's my, my introduction to the, yeah, that wacky, sure, wacky yeah. world. But season two, Going maybe. back through it, season Dude, two, season two. two. <laughs> Something so special. Yeah, it is. It, it is. just, I don't think there's a bad second in season two. Yeah, it's <laughs> it so just, fun. It's so yeah. good. It, it's no, a wild knowing ride. what's going to happen and knowing the elaborateness, seeing these moments before they play out. Yeah, it's mm. been a while since I watched season two. Mm. I should, mm. someday, mm -hmm. wait for it. rewatch. I'm hoping I'm hoping the rest of it comes to Netflix because I haven't. Yeah. Seen. Yeah, I'd love I'll to get your there. thoughts. Um, season three is a very fun time. Yep. I love season four. Cool. So cool. Uh, it's very, very good. Next, we have Oh Yes, Cool Great. Thank you, Oh Yes, Cool Great. And after that, we have Gift of Heaven, Whoa. which is a free 3DS RPG which strives to be as funny as Earthbound, oh efficient as Chrono Trigger, Whoa. and as epic as Final Fantasy VI. Right through the heart. And you're to blame, Gift of Heaven. Uh, Gift of Heaven quadruples every data limit of RPG Maker FES using passwords to unite four game files as one bold explosion. O.M. Hawkstelter is cooking the full blast Tolkien Potter Gump combo meal. That's Forrest Gump. What? You what? deserve to eat. <laughs> and then Hawkstelters don't skip on the shrimp. <laughs> Gift of Heaven's promotional short film, Symphonia Anathema, hits YouTube April 17th. Nice. Download the prologue August 7th and Act 1 on Halloween night via the RPG Maker FES 3DS app. Buckle up, Buttercup. Ragnarok cometh. <laughs> It's was, very that, fun to read. Did you, was that an off the cuff Bon Jovi quote or was that Ben? That was that was me. Oh. I did the Bon Jovi quote. I wasn't prepared for that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you were to blame. I jumped to cherish that. Yeah. Maybe that was special. Yeah, that was mm. that was that was me just jumping in there. Uh, next sponsor is Yolt Main, which is a very fun name to say. Uh, sorry to say that this is the last month. Oh. Yolt Main is going to be able to sponsor Frame Trap. Thank you. Thank you for your support, Yolt Main. 
Uh, I'll still be a patron, but just on a smaller level. I hope to one day be able to be a must-be-nice sponsor again. Yeah. Thanks to all the allies who have come out and hung out during my streams. Special shout-out to Xanagir and Tahitian Warrior for helping me improve. Now, this is my last battle cry to all allies listening. Let's get one push on my channel and help me get affiliated. I love hanging out with this community nice. and want to do it a lot more in the future. My Twitch handle is Yoltmain. That is Y-O-L-T-M-A-Y-N-E. Thanks again, and everyone, and as always, love and respect. Hmm. Thank you, old man. Our last regular sponsor is Wolf Wolf Games. With so many values and civil rights at stake, it's essential for us to support organizations that fight to present actionable solutions to hate and sexism. Women's rights are human rights. RAIN, R-A-I-N-N, is the largest organization in this country dedicated to ending sexual violence. By fundraising or helping to volunteer with the National Sexual Assault Hotline, your contributions will matter. Visit www.rain.org to learn more. You are the difference. And it's time, dear audience, for our mega sponsor... You know, I never asked them to, to give me like <laughs> reactions like that, but I appreciate it. It helps. It, it makes, oh, yeah. makes it a little bit better, a little bit sweeter. Our mega sponsor is River Horse Incorporated. Our friends over at River Horse can teach you the ways of the ServiceNow platform. Do you think that email and spreadsheets are a thing of the past? So do we. <laughs> See how we are helping companies transform the world of work. What is ServiceNow? It's a platform, a piece of technology that lets people automate their business. We are part of the movement to create great work experiences and unlock productivity for employees and the enterprise. With Riverhorse, you will learn to master ServiceNow capabilities through hands-on real-world instruction. As an authorized training partner, our education advisors are able to teach over 12 official classes. Join us at Knowledge 19 in Vegas from May 5th to the 9th, the industry's biggest conference of the year. Learn more at river-horse.com. Riverhorse will be teaching in the pre-conference training and hosting several events throughout the week. Reach out to them on Twitter or email to join them and get some free swag. Riverhorse is, is proud to support the Easy Allies and look forward to supporting all allies that work in the IT industry. Train to transform. Once again, that website is www.river-horse.com. Thank you so much, River Horse. Thank you. And now... I love hearing about a conference I didn't know. Mm. I love new conferences. <laughs> Those, but there's so many. Knowledge conferences. There's conferences I, is, for there, is there a list out there with like all major conferences? Conference.com. Oh, yeah, even I, just like tabletop cons is like, yeah. just like 800 of them, you know? <laughs> I've, been to, I've been to PAX, but I've never been to like a tabletop con. That'd be fun. Hmm. There's PAX Unplugged. I've always wanted to mm -hmm. go check out. And, you know, I've only been to PAX East. I've never been to regular PAX. Ooh. Yeah. I've never Ooh, been to PAX I've never East. been to either. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> never been to either over here. <laughs> yeah. Come on. Yeah. All right. Now it's time to play a game. Uh, so this is going to be multiple choice. I'm going to give you the name of a celebrity or celebrities, nice, and you're nice. going to tell me yes. okay. which game they appeared in. I'm going to give you three options. As soon as you know it, shout an answer. If you get it wrong, I'll give the other person a chance to steal. Okay. Are we ready? Totally ready. Yeah. I got one locked and loaded. I feel bad because I accidentally read one earlier. Yeah, so to give you full context so for this, just it wasn't, give Brandon the point. It wasn't really his fault. Uh, we we were he was checking my mic. I was like in the control room. I was like, "Hey, Brad, go over to my seat and check my mic." And he accidentally saw it. I'm oh, like, dude, I'm so sick. Up. I don't even remember what that was. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, our first name, but it, it's just it, for fun. I don't fun. know if it's true or not. Though. It's okay. just for I just, fun. Okay. I didn't see the whole. I just saw a name. Okay. Our first celebrity is Justin Bieber. Did they appear in A, Call of Duty Advanced Warfare, B, Grand Theft Auto V, or C, NBA 2K13? I didn't see the answer for this, so I don't know, actually. Okay. NBA 2K13? That's, That's I, correct. Yeah, good. Yes. Brandon's on the board. I wish it was Call of Duty, though. Yeah. That would have been amazing. It would have been amazing. It's, they just had a screenshot of like Justin Bieber in a basketball jersey, and I was just like, <laughs> That's so funny. That's just funny. That's just All right. Funny. <laughs> uh, Barack Obama and Sarah Palin. Or do they appear in Destroy All Humans, Mercenaries 2, or Duke Nukem Forever? Duke Nukem Forever? Brandon? Uh, Your yeah, options I'd... are Destroy All Humans or Mercenaries 2. Uh, I'll probably go Duke as well. Mercenaries 2 was a long time ago. It was Mercenaries 2. Mercenaries wow, that seems like 2? 20 years ago. Yeah. Uh, I, I believe there are skins that in game. that game. Oh. Wow. Yeah. I thought NBA Jam was going to be thrown out. I don't know if Palin's in Jam, but I think Obama's. Barack, yeah. 
Next is Ariana Grande. Does she appear in Final Fantasy Brave Exvius? Final Fantasy Brave Exodus. Brad is on the board. <laughs> I knew this one because well I remember done. I was like, what? Yep. Well, I said well, that. Well, Brad is on the board. The other options were Kingdom Hearts, Union Cross, or Final Fantasy Record Keeper. Brad got it. Nice, nice. Fourth, we've got two more. Oh, man. Roddy Piper. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Or is he? Does he appear in Saints Row 4, Sleeping Dogs, or Eat Lead, The Return of Matt Hazard? Uh... Saints Row 4? It's right! Yes! It's nice. right! That was a shot in the dark, baby. Yeah, I never Keith played David that game. and Roddy Piper are nice. in Saints Row 4. It. Wow. Uh, my favorite one is last, Fred Durst. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do it. Does Fred Durst appear in Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance, wow. Tao Fang and Fist of the Lotus, or Fight Club the video game? Uh, Tao Fang? No. Damn. Fight Club? Fight Club! Damn. Yeah! <laughs> That puts us at two and two. I uh, know there's a Fight Club game. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'd never played the Fight Club video game, but it's very funny that Fred Durst is in anything. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so you guys actually have the what my favorite way to end a caught in the frame trap. You're both tied, which means mm. you will take both of your skills, abilities, and talents to break us out of here. You have to figure out a way to combine those efforts so we can we don't have to deal with these demons any longer. Hmm. Down. You want to just do something, Brad, and I'll wee. I'll, I'll, wee. I'll wee along. I'll give you the encouragement. Uh, okay. <laughs> We're going to do a death blow, baby. Oh, oh. break the posture. Break in the posture. <laughs> Boom. Boom. Then the death blow. <laughs> 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 Blood spray. <laughs> That's how I feel. Every time I jump off of a tower. Okay. So you weren't being the enemy getting killed saying wee. No, you I were was... describing the field. He oh, was, yeah. He was watching. Going, yeah. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. Uh... I got to play the beta for something that I'm really excited about that I think you guys will actually be interested in. Uh, I've played some Mortal Kombat 11, uh, and so I played it at the reveal event with Michael Huber, which was awesome, and then I played the stress test, and now I've played the beta. Um, And my warmth toward Mortal Kombat 11 has just, it just keeps going up. Uh, First of all, visually, it's amazing. Like, I think just on the level of I want to see these characters do things because it looks so good, it works. Like, I I think you could enjoy and feel satisfied with this purchase just on that level. Like, I'm really stunned by it. Um, And the customization is so much fun. So you get, like... Jade, and it's like okay, I can give her a custom mask. I can give her like her own the the staff that she wields. I can do it, whatever I want it to be. Make it look as ridiculous as possible. And even just in the beta, it's fun tinkering around with those things. So I can't imagine what it's like actually unlocking things and messing around with all of that. Like you can make Cabal look completely different, like a whole new character. Where you go like, whoa, I'm surprised that's even in there. So I'm really impressed on that level. Um, but mechanically, I like it a lot more than I was expecting to. It's definitely slower than I feel like Mortal Kombat X was. And I am not a like competitive Mortal Kombat player. I, I generally play these games just for the story. But I was getting into Mortal Kombat 11 so much that I was like, I think I'm in for more than the story mode. Like, I want to go online. I want to compete against people. I'm having a good time. And uh, it does kind of the classic Mortal Kombat thing where... The inputs are very easy to do, and the combos are very easy to do, and it's super easy to do, like, okay, you hit square, triangle, circle, that'll be a combo, but if you hit, like, uh, square, triangle, and then do a special move, that'll work. And so it's it's a fighting game where it's very intuitive to kind of figure out how these different components are pieced together. Um, but it's a game where, like, because it's a little bit slower, I feel like it's easier to kind of get into those mental mind games of, like, oh, okay, they went in, they did their thing, I blocked it, now I see my window, I can get in there and punish. And so it's a lot of back and forth, uh, which is really cool. And the... The stages are gorgeous, and I was talking to Don, and he was like, man, if you pay attention to the stages, there's so much going on. Like, there's these people back there, but they're not just on the simple loop. They're doing, like, this long thing, and I haven't really paid attention to those people that much. I'm taking that on Don's word uh, because I've been focused on the fighting. But, uh, like, like Mortal Kombat... Uh, the Mortal Kombat's of the past, you can interact with the stages, and my favorite one is you're, like, in this desert, and there's a cactus, and you just grab them, and you <laughs> shove their face into the cactus, and you That's rub good. it up against there, uh, and it's really, really good. Um, but, yeah, I feel like in fighting games, I tend to very quickly uh, find somebody that I like, and then it's like, okay, well, 
this is so difficult to learn that like I'm kind of all in on this character. Whereas uh, with, and there are exceptions to that. Uh, I like playing as a bunch of people in Smash, for instance. But uh, in Mortal Kombat 11, like I had fun playing everybody and I felt like they were all easy to pick up, but that didn't make them all feel the same. Like I, as Baraka, I felt very aggressive immediately because his moves promoted that. Whereas Jade, it's like, okay, I have so much distance and I can use this giant staff uh, to hit her from, to hit people from far away. And it's like, it's easy to do both of these things, but they feel so different. And I'm getting different sorts of satisfaction from both. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, it's, it's hard because when you're talking, I think, about mechanics so specifically, I just don't have the experience or confidence to be like, yes, this is definitively good or bad. But from my perspective, where I'm coming from, I really think that they've thought this through in a way that I really appreciate. And we've talked multiple times on this show about the different approaches to p get people into fighting games. And I feel like with Mortal Kombat 11 specifically, the pace of the game and the way that they're doing the mechanics make it easier than ever without feeling like it's completely mindless. Like, there's still a lot of depth there. It's still fun beating people. Um, and I commend them. And, and one final thing that needs to be in every fighting game forever is... So there was no training mode in the beta. You could do these classic towers where you like fight five people. Right. But while I was doing that, I used that as a training mode because what they let you do is that you pause, go into your move list, and they, they let you tag 10 moves. It could be anything. It could be right. combos. Yeah, yeah. Oh. It could be spe uh, special attacks. It can be fatalities. So I just have this list of 10 things. So and I'd great. be like, yeah, I would just do those things, yeah. get that muscle memory built up, tag another five things or whatever. And it's just, it's so that nice. That is cool. Yeah, yeah. It's so nice. Uh, it's really, really good. Because I probably won't do that much experimentation. I'll, I'll just like give each character a shot. Yeah. It's like what I did with Injustice 2. And then I just like Catwoman of all people. Mm -hmm. I was like, I Catwoman love really the way Catwoman controls. In Injustice, yeah. And I felt like just naturally when I wanted her to do something, she kind of did it. And so yeah. I was like, okay, I think I have a lead on her more than most other characters. Right. So it's fun. Like once I pick like, ah, oh, Sub-Zero. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, to, to specifically train and be like, okay, I want to get good at just this one character. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm excited for that. Yeah. I don't know if man. I'm going to uh, actually fork over cash just because I'm, like, getting caught up on a bunch of games. I don't know how much time. Right. And, like, Dreams and Days Gone or you know, yeah, in, the middle close. Of, in the middle and the end of next month. Does Brandon Jones have a go-to Mortal Kombat character? I don't. Well, wow. I'm excited to see oh. who that is. Yeah. Yeah. I Stylistically, probably Johnny Cage because he's just so <laughs> funny. But, uh, see, to me, I would I would think you'd immediately go to Aaron Black. Okay. The the gunslinger, the cowboy. Oh. Yeah, he's got guns. Yeah, guns. twin Ooh. twin revolvers. He reflects bullets off of coins. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. I think I think it just takes like thirty seconds if you're watching Aaron Black and you'll be on board. Nice. Yeah. Uh, Brad, do you have a go-to Mortal Kombat character? Sub-Zero. Yeah, baby. we talked about this. We right. talked about this since the beginning. Yeah. yeah. Do you, where's your hype at for Mortal Kombat? 11? Do you have uh, any? I like World Kong games. I I didn't really play X at all. I played a little of Nine. Mm -hmm. I'm really hyped to play through the story mode. I just don't know if I'm going to like go online necessarily and fight. Sure. Maybe I'll play at home a couple times with people and stuff like that, but I don't know about like going all out. But I want to go through the story mode. It yeah. looks awesome. Um, it's, it's something that I feel like I've been kind of teetering back and forth on is you have this new mechanic, uh, this fatal blow mechanic, where once your health gets low, you can press L2 and R2 and do this super move, basically, and it does a lot of damage, but it takes quite a long time. Um, and so you'll, if you're playing a character, you'll see the same kind of lengthy animations over and over again. And I was like, oh, man, I'm worried I'm going to get sick of that. And, you know, just beta stress test right now. We're not at full release level, so maybe I will get sick of it. I don't know. But I think just so far, the animations are so over the top. <laughs> and by the time my health gets low and either me or my opponent is doing a fatal blow, I kind of need a breather from the match anyway. Right. Um, and so it, not, not that it's not annoying at all, but it, it's not driving me mad right. so far in the way that I thought it would be. Um, okay. So that's a nice surprise. Yeah, it is nice. For sure. Three things I'm looking forward to in that game. Yeah. Just coming off of Injustice. And a reason why, I, Brad, I'll probably play a little bit of multiplayer, mm -hmm. because this was so satisfying in Injustice 2, was I'd load into a match and, like, a Swamp Thing would come in. I'd be like, what are you wearing? Like, yeah. there were so many crazy, not only just things you could add on, but, like, color schemes. Mm -hmm. So, like, Harley would come in and just pink, all pink. And just yeah. like, whoa, what a choice. Like, I've never even seen that stuff unlocked. Mm -hmm. um, that game is gorgeous like yes. this it's it's crazy that like mortal kombat's kind of leading is, is one of the leaders i think in this gen in terms of just like amazing faces amazing animation yeah. and, uh, so much personality so many characters and it's not like oh these characters clearly got more attention than these others 
and uh, just the impact, just yeah. how, how 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 it feels. Oh man, uh, I think probably my favorites is like the way that it sounds when Jade hits you with that pull, like that reverberating clang mm-hmm. is so good. Yeah, so instantly really gratifying. Good. Just the yeah. first yeah. time you do a cool thing. Yes. Um, yeah, it's one of those things, and I've I've said this about multiple fighting games, but I think it's a good quality every time. Where it's like it's it, it's satisfying no matter what level you're on. Yeah. Right. Um, but something that kind of drove me nuts. I, I didn't play a ton of Injustice Two, but in Tekken Seven, you can also customize your characters, and uh, it like sometimes people would be funny, and I'd be like, aha, that's pretty cool. When I would see them for the first time, and sometimes it'd be like, oh, you're just trying to be as annoying as possible. Yes. And like Online I gaming. don't I don't love that. Like that, right. your patience wears thin after a while, and only seen it in the beta so maybe it becomes bad later on but something that i like about mortal kombat 11 and i feel it more than other games that allow customization is like everything i'm seeing makes sense with that character it may be wildly different but it's like oh no this is what this character would wear. This fits. It doesn't feel like some crazy outlandish, haha, this is just a goof kind yeah, of Yeah, I'm thing. not going to see Scorpion wearing like a clown party hat or anything. Right, right. It's like, okay, I get enough options and enough variety and I can look cool, but I'm not like some exactly clown version of Scorpion. And so I hope my feeling with that remains uh, in the full release as well. I really like that a lot. And there was one more thing I was going to say. I don't remember. Was Shao Kahn in it? The beta? Shao Kahn was not in the beta. So Shao Kahn, I believe, is pre-order. Yeah. And Shang Tsung is the first DLC. Oh. Mortal Kombat 11, yeah. First DLC character announced. Okay. Um, What I was going to say, so Mortal Kombat... Uh, X when it came out, yeah. I thought it was gorgeous. I was like, "Wow, this this is a really good looking game." The the uh, attention to details really good. I felt the same way about Injustice Two. Kind of in my Mortal Kombat Eleven hype period, I went back after playing Mortal Kombat Eleven to, to just play a little bit of the story mode of Mortal Kombat X, uh, which I hadn't played since release. And I was like, "This game looks like garbage in comparison." <laughs> like, I really think that's kind of the level that Mortal Kombat yeah. Eleven is operating yeah. on. Is it, yeah. it's such a huge step up. Of course, that was twenty fifteen. I believe so it was some time ago but you know kudos to them this really feels like a it's, huge like a, it's an interesting mix because like the last trailer that they came out with during the state of play was so goofy and mm-hmm. so silly yeah and the world still holds up yeah. you know like it's I still believe it I'm still gonna be invested in this mm-hmm. I'm still extremely curious to see what happens under what conditions where I'm fighting someone you can even see kind of I think Jax like fights Jax and he's just like you know, you know me yeah. myself and I yeah. like so like just classic like mm-hmm. oh we're in I can see the background we're in this zone time to fight yeah um so it's it's funny that there's so much comedy there, there's so much over the topness, but it's so clear they've given so much attention and love and care and detail to yeah. every single character in the game. Absolutely. It's an interesting mix. Uh, the one thing I, I hope doesn't happen uh, is in Mortal Kombat X, it felt like they, they had a story, they didn't know how to wrestle between telling the story that they wanted to tell and including all the characters that they wanted to include. It felt mm. like those things were clashing, mm. where they were like going after an objective and people would pop up and it'd be like, okay, why are you here? Okay, you're here, but you're not really doing that much right. or your your presence or introduction or conclusion feels really awkward and out of place. Um, and so I'm hoping that with Mortal Kombat 11 in the story mode, it it doesn't feel that way quite as much. Is right. When you do decide to give somebody screen time, it makes sense, it feels impactful, all of that. But yeah, shout outs to Mortal Kombat shout 11. Out. Shout out. Um, Brandon, Ma? I don't know if you have any interest in this, but I think you might. Uh, I just played a tiny bit. This is just a small shout out to the Elder Scrolls Blades. Oh, I got a games? notification on my phone and it said, hey, you yeah. pre-ordered this or something. You want to play <laughs> it's it? It's out. <laughs> <You're> yeah. Like, <laughs> and I know Huber is really excited about this game. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I checked it out for a little bit and it... it my impression so far, it's way cooler and more in depth than I thought it was going to be, but I also think it could get really tiresome very quickly. Um, and that's actually how I felt about Fallout Shelter, where I was kind of enamored with it at first, and right. I was like, wait, I don't want to keep tapping on these things. Mm-hmm. Um, so what Elder Scrolls Blades is, is it's a full-on RPG, and it's a first-person RPG. Um, and what that means is you're going and you're exploring and you're doing quests. You're actually like in a town, you're talking to people, they will give you something to do, you go to that place and you do it. And then as you're going through these dungeons, through these environments, there's loot for you to find, there's people to save, all of that stuff. Um, and the way combat works is... You have a button to kind of bring up your shield, which you can just hold down, but you attack by holding down on the screen 
and then swiping to slash. Mm -hmm. And the thing that really makes that more fun is if you, when you hold down, a circle kind of fills up. And if you time it just right and you like slash when that circle is fully filled up, you'll do more damage. Mm -hmm. And I think that timing aspect is something that the game desperately needs because I think it would get boring holding, swiping, holding, swiping. Yeah. And so it feels like there's some element of skill there that makes that repetition worthwhile, uh, which is really cool. Uh, but you have this town and you build it up. And so uh, early on, I, I like cleared out or I rebuilt a town hall and now I need to like go and restore a blacksmith. And so I like the idea of having a space much like the Division 2 uh, that you're slowly working on over time. I think that's really, really cool. Um, and something that I really liked is there's a character creator, and I feel like it, it was more involved, gave me more options, so you can do the classic thing of, of picking all the Elder Scrolls races, they will give you certain buffs. Um, and it's a fully 3D character, and you're getting gear, and you actually see the gear on your person. Oh. So when you're in the character screen, if you put on a new helm, cool. you see it. And so, yeah, there's a lot more uh, traditional RPG uh, than I was expecting. But... A couple of things, when you're in these environments, you just, like, tap to move. And because you're in this 3D environment, you, like, tap, and it's like, oh, wait, no, I wanted to go farther. I wanted to go less than that. And so it, you just don't have the amount of uh, control right. that an analytic would have. And that's okay because when you lock into fights, it's kind of like you're locked in, and so it's not like things are chasing after you that right. I've seen. Um, and so it's you have room to make those mistakes, but it's still a little frustrating. The other worry that I have is repetition. Like, oh, it's neat that I get to go and do quests and kill things, but is that going to be every single moment of this game right. where it's like, okay, clear out this area, go back to town, work on this thing, get a quest, go out, fight some things, go back to town. I'm worried that, you know, after a couple of days, I'm just not going to want to do it anymore. So, Brandon, you play a lot of mobile games. Uh, is there anything about the Elder Scrolls Blades that has you worried or excited? Um, I think, yeah, I'm always nervous about translating some kind of established console game to a mobile <laughs> device, you know, where mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the mobile games that I tend to gravitate towards, like, only exist on mobile. Like, they're yeah. only using systems that uh, um, either either is something, like you were saying, with uh, Fallout, where it's, like, not a ton of brain power required. It's just kind of a fun thing to check in on. Right. Oh, you're also growing. The environment, like I love Tiny Tower back in the day. It's fun to just keep adding levels to a thing and, yeah. and seeing all the people walk around. Um, I think the big thing for me is how epic it's like trying to feel. Mm -hmm. You know, like again, if it's really trying to encapsulate that Elder Scrolls experience, like you're never going to get there for me. <laughs> like I'm never going to feel, you know, as immersed as I am like because right. I, I almost exclusively go ranged in every single Elder Scrolls game I actually just started Morrowind because it was free and I was like eh, why not nice and so it's interesting going through that game and and, and trying out the bow and and uh, uh, so I love a, like a ranking of the bows with Brandon and right. yeah uh, so it, it, like the hallmark of a good mobile game for me is you can just throw a dart at a board, pick any sort of timeline, 10 seconds to a minute to a half an hour, and it works. Yeah. You can play this game for any sort of duration. You can just stop on a dime. I can just be like, oh, oh that's, my dentist called me. I'm ready to go. And just immediately just hit the button, and I don't mm -hmm. think about it. Right. And it's not something where then when I boot it back up, it's like, well, hold on. You stopped playing, and it's online only, and so I got to log back in, and we didn't save your progress. Uh, so I don't know. Do you know how, like... How that works? Was it forgiving in a sense of just like, could you stop a mission right in the middle of it and then come back? Yeah. So I, I really, I've only, the, the reason why I consider this like a shout out, this, I, I had like one session with sure, it. Yeah. I was just late at night and I was like, oh, I can play this. And I, I tried it out and I thought it was interesting enough to, to bring to the show. But I, I can't give you, outside of that one session, I haven't had it in a lot of different experiences. I do like how, uh, I think Bethesda has been a little hit or miss with just kind of how much they've advertised some of their games, mm. like oversold them like a little bit. I thought the press conference was weird the way this got announced. But it seems like they have the right attitude about Blades. Yeah. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it went through like a, like a design shift. I remember at mm. some point they were like, what you saw at the press conference is still, for the most part, the game, but we changed it up a little bit. Oh. We changed the pace of how it works or something. I might be completely making that up. Um, but it seems like, although they obviously want to sell, like, it's Elder Scrolls Mobile. Right. It, I'm not seeing, like, a ton of trailers for it. You know, I'm not seeing, like, this full court press where there's, yeah. like, if you're an Elder Scrolls fan, you're doing yourself a disservice by not playing this. It just seems like, hey, it's fun. It's, mm -hmm. just a, it, it's, it's, an, it's a weird mobile game. And... Uh, um, uh, reminds me of Infinity Blade. 
I was thinking yeah, of that too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It um, I definitely had some. I, I thought of Infinity Blade as those very I was early mobile memories, and mm-hmm. uh, I got a huge kick out of that. Yeah. Uh, but that was great because it had a very linear design. It was very smart in being like, all you got to stress is kind of where you want to go, what enemy you want to fight versus another enemy, and each encounter on its own. But like you were saying, like just this, if it's tough to navigate, if it's tough to move specifically where I want to move, or if I'm really limited, because one of the, the greatest things about Elder Scrolls to me is just how much freedom you have. That like, uh, when I was playing Skyrim, I talked to a friend, and he's like, I'm just doing spells, that's it. And I'm like, I'm just doing the bow. And some people are like, I'm I'm playing exclusively in third person. And I'm like, right. whoa, that's not the way I would play it, but cool, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, I actually want to- So I wonder how much that freedom is in there. To talk to you about that, because I feel like I, I have almost unfair and contradictory expectations with mobile games. Uh, where I, I both think they need to be perfect for the platform and make sense for the platform, but if you are going for something similar to uh, a series that I already know and love, like I need it to kind of satisfy me in that way too. And I feel like those things are butting heads sometimes. Even yeah. in my very limited time with Elder Scrolls Blades, I'd be talking to a townsperson and I'd just be like, shut up, I, I, <laughs> I'm on a phone, let me go and move and do things. And uh, Not that it was doing anything wrong, but... When I was in a dungeon, I was like, oh, man, if this was an actually an Elder Scrolls game, I could just leave this dungeon and go out in the world and find a new place. And so not being able to do that, it's like I'm surprised that it had as much as it did. But the more that you do right, the more you kind of expect, which also doesn't feel very fair. Right. Like uh, I have this on and off again relationship uh, with Fire Emblem Heroes where I th- sometimes I'll play it really intensely and I'll love it. And then there are other times where I'm like, I wish you were just a real Fire Emblem game. Yeah, totally. Uh, you know, where I was like, oh, I don't want to wait for the next part of the story. I just want to see what happens. And, uh, yeah, I don't know how to fight that. It's not necessarily the game's doing anything wrong. It's just my own expectation and history uh, with the series. Does that ever, like, you played the Kingdom Hearts mobile game, right? Yeah, briefly. Okay. The only mobile game I played and really liked was Angry Birds. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. I loved Did Angry Did you play... Birds. You, I think you would play like Angry Birds Star Wars. Oh, right? hell yeah. Yeah, man. that was your jam. Yeah, it was so fun, man. So how did you... I'm really fascinated by this, Brad. I don't think we've ever <laughs> talked about Angry Birds no, on Frame Track. Ever brought it. Did you like play it obsessively, just pick at it here and there? I picked at it here and there. Okay. Uh, I don't think I ever played a mobile game obsessively. It, it was just a really simple, easy game to pick up and play with a really easy really easy mechanics to understand. Yeah. Just those, like cool those have like, like physics, puzzle, like clearing a level. It's just really fun. Those have like a shit ton of levels, right? Shit ton. Yeah. Okay. So many. Have you finished every level? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. Because like, I was playing like Angry Birds 1 or something and I saw Star Wars 1 I was like, oh, I'll go to that one. Yeah. I don't know if I like completely finished all of them. But Got you. I played here and there. It was fun. And it was so nerdy because they went by the movies. So when yeah. you're playing that, like, I remember episode four, like, launched with it. And then, like, the yeah. Empire Strikes Back update and Return of the Jedi update. Yeah, it was just, it was just good time, man. Yeah. Nice. Just simple little phone game. Yeah. Uh, Blades reminds me a lot of, like, quality of life uh, because I played, like, Galaxy of Heroes is my, my crack. Like, it's the game I yeah. come back to every single day. Yeah. And it's fascinating how that game has evolved in terms of, like, they'll do an update where they'll be like, this is this is in this menu now. You don't have to click one menu in. We've added that button to the side there. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, it's kind of unnecessary. And then I'll use it. And I'm like, that's great. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, Thanks for doing that. And it's like something that I think is hard for a developer to just think of all those permutations. But like the more a game goes on, the more you really start to parse everyone's opinions on forums and, and online. Yeah. Uh, you start to realize like, oh, yeah, we can just wh- – why is this system even in there? Why, why don't we just make that easy? Uh, and I wonder if Blades is going to evolve in that way. Where if they're like a year from now, it's like if you really don't care about the story, just skip it. You know, <laughs> you just <laughs> you just want a dungeon. Like there's a mode you can go in that's just dungeon after dungeon after dungeon. You never have to go back to the town. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't care about it growing up. But if you're like that's a big thing for me, then it's like oh well now the dungeon's maybe a little bit smaller and you can spend more time talking to people, spend more time upgrading the town. Um, but if it's just like stuck in its ways and no no yeah. no, this is the experience we wanted. You better like it. That's like always the bad take for a mobile game. Something that that can drive me absolutely bonkers in a mobile game is waiting for things. Like sure. want, and they always get you. I actually played a lot of Fallout Shelter because at different points I would be excited about Fallout, and I, I feel like sometimes these things are good, like hype companions, where it's like, okay, yeah. I can't bring the full experience with me, but I can have like that branding on the go. As gross as that sounds, <laughs> um, but every time I would get really mad at Fallout Shelter because. 
it would start like and I would I would do a whole new vault or whatever and early on I'd be like this takes 30 seconds or a minute and be like oh cool and you kind of have that dopamine rush of everything happening quickly and you're expanding quickly and then be like now you've got to wait 45 minutes Um, and it just felt like I was just watching a bunch of timers and I was like this isn't fun this is just manipulative and you just want me to keep checking back in and even in Elder Scrolls Blades uh, you'll go and you'll find chests and right now it'll be like it'll take five seconds for this chest to open but like I know I'm going to get to chests that take minutes to open, if not hours to open. And it's just, I think it's it's hard to get excited about that. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's hard once you reach that point, and I feel like they do very much early on try to get you used to the rhythm, but it's hard when you realize that you're being monetized. Mm-hmm. Sure. And, and it just, you just, <clears throat> yeah, you don't even feel like a, 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 a person anymore. Like, it's hard to be immersed or care about what's going on when it's just like, okay, what way are they going to try to bait me into spending a buck right. or two? Um, and that's just where I get really turned off. And it might sound vile and disgusting, but like, there's a way to do it. There's a way to do that that makes sense for the format of the game, makes sense. I, I you know, I, I feel like Galaxy of Heroes is wrap it up. I'm getting to a point where like, there's some stores in the game that like, I own everything in the store. And I'm like, yeah. oh, it feels like, mm-hmm. feels like they're running out of characters. Yeah. So I'm just like, uh, KOTOR, uh, yeah. like, um, uh, but uh, it, yeah, it's interesting to to play one game versus another because it seems like something that's just just gross as yeah. a rule, but like there, there is a way to do it. There is a way to manage expectations. And I think one of the, the worst things you can do is to repackage an experience. I've already played multiple times right. into a format that is allowing me to wait. Um, and that's what I love Star Wars. Cause it's like the turn based Star Wars outside of KOTOR. And these were all new characters. Yeah. So it's just like putting together a rebels team, putting together a team of like Biggs and wedge and Luke yeah. and mm-hmm. Lamb is fun. I, I think the other thing that makes it kind of less, easy to go along with that sort of system is I've seen so many games monetized in the exact same way right. and if you've fallen for it once when you pick up the new game you're like I don't want to do that again Yeah. and it just it makes it really hard to buy in where you know like a year from now there's going to be another game that's going to try to get me in the exact same way and as they keep going down this monetization route it's just like I'm I'm, I'm not going to fall for it every time and I know I, I don't I think the audience in a, a somewhat of a general sense will get sick of it as well right. and like you're gonna have to I don't know do better I guess mm-hmm. the last game that uh, I want to shout out and a lot of these games are my games so I, I apologize to the audience if it's gotten a little tiresome but I can't let this episode end without talking about Crypt of the Necrodancer at least yeah, a little dude. bit um, and I know Brad you've played it so maybe mm-hmm. you can help me out here Grip of the Necrodancer is a game I always meant to check out. It came out some time ago. I don't know when it came out. Years, yeah. Yeah, and uh, it always looked cool, but just one of those games that slipped through the cracks, and they announced this new Zelda game that they're doing. I happened to to kind of be a sucker for Zelda, and so I was like, well, I might as well check this thing out uh, before, before the Zelda game comes out. And, like, I love it. Mm-hmm. I suck at it, and I, it, it's either either I suck at it or it's really hard or a combination yeah, of the Yeah, I remember two. it being pretty difficult yeah and the reason why it's so difficult for those of you who don't know what it is is it's this this roguelike dungeon crawler where you're you're going through floors um but you have to move and attack uh based on the rhythm of the song that's playing and the enemies will move and attack based on the rhythm of the song and so like you kind of want to position yourself in such a way where you can get next to them and fight them but you're not in their path where they can hit you and you're just going along and it's like da 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 and just getting in tune with that song yeah. and fighting things feels so good and clever and this game does so much with so very little it's a very basic sprite based presentation but there's so much heart there you'll be like bouncing around you'll go into a shop and the shopkeeper will start singing the opera in guy. the rhythm yeah. of the song and you're like I love you game mm-hmm. you're amazing um and yeah, so many things that make it uh, a little intoxicating. I think the roguelike nature really, really helps. Um, you'll get different types of weapons that uh, not only mess with your enemies in different ways, but mess with your own rhythm. And so you might get a weapon that attacks in a wide range, and it's like, oh, okay, I can hit a guy like diagonal to me, but and that's really cool and useful. But I also have to like account for the beats as I'm positioning myself. Like I don't have to just be right next to them. And so it, it helps you, but it also kind of throws you off. Or you might get a weapon where you need to reload, and it's like, okay, I'm bopping along. Need to make sure I reload in rhythm, so I'm not messing everything up. 
and it's just it's it's really addicting um, and and just kind of intoxicating. Like you just keep wanting to do runs. Um, I feel like the the system that they have as you go through, you'll get diamonds, which you can unlock a whole bunch of different things, um, and you'll find in cages people that you can bring back into your hub, mm -hmm. and so you'll need keys to unlock them, and so you'll you'll want to get coins so you can buy keys or you'll find them out in the world, and it's just it's all really brilliant and unique and clever. I can see why Nintendo loved this game. Um, but yes, it's very, very difficult. Yeah. Brad, you played it when it came out on PC. What was your experience like with the game, and did you stick with it? Um, I played it. It was kind of like I remember it being challenging when I played it. Sorry, yeah. this was like four years ago, I think, so <laughs> sure. I'm really trying to remember. I do remember it being really fun. I got... I played for probably like five hours of the game or something mm -hmm. like that. I mean, I didn't. It was just a game to me that I just picked up and played every now and then. Right. You didn't. You didn't necessarily. Yeah. I was like, I gotta beat to. this game right now. Yeah, yeah. I was just kind of having fun going through it. That's what I remember. But I do remember it being fun. I remember it being yeah. challenging. Uh, you can unlock different characters, right? Yes, you can. Okay. Uh, that's when you, the people when you, you get free. through like a zone. So I got through the first zone and I unlocked yeah. a new character. Yeah, yes. it was something cool. Like I never played anything like that at the time. I was just like, wow, this is awesome. The music was super fun. Yeah. It was. Yeah. It was challenging. I had a good time with it. Yeah, I, I feel like there have been kind of a, for a while now, uh, an onrush of, an onrush, not the game, a rush, rush. of <laughs> of uh, roguelites. It's a term. Yeah, and yeah. I, I've checked out a bunch, but it it's not very often that one sticks. Uh, I really love Spelunky. I think that's an exceptional game, and I really love Rogue Legacy, um, and I, I feel like this is kind of on that level sure. for me, um, where it's just so... It's so different and unique, so I think that helps a yeah. lot. Brandon, were you a Spelunky fan? Uh, no, I never gave it a shot. You should. I, I just know you love Indiana Jones a lot. It see how c compare. Just give me a quick comparison between Spelunky and SteamWorld Dig. Very different. Okay. Very different. So okay. uh, I very very much enjoyed SteamWorld Dig. SteamWorld Dig is is more of a Metroidvania. Like you are exploring and you're going along all these different paths. And it, it's yeah, it's a lot more like that. Whereas Spelunky is like. You gotta survive. Yeah. Like, yes, you're exploring zones, and you're getting through, but it's like sometimes you just need to get to the exit as quickly as possible mm -hmm. um, because things are coming to kill you. Yeah. Um, so different in that sense. More more about survival, I would say. Uh, yeah, that kind of difficulty as evidence going back to the beginning of Frame Trap. Not, yeah. not a lot of experience with Souls. Like I, sure. I don't seek out games to punish me, but yeah. Uh, Spelunky is one of those games that's always stood out for me in terms of people that love it love it so. Right. much you yeah. know like any sort of announcement anything else from that dev you just see people in spelunky shirts like it's uh, yeah uh like like top five games lists you know yeah. good like oh okay that's saying something yeah i feel like uh, so uh between this and i was talking about baba is you last frame trap i there's this not only it, it's <laughs> it's a time of guilt i feel like <laughs> brandon because not only are these these big box games coming out that are just tickling me in all sorts of great ways, you get all these independent games where I'm like, you are a genius. You, the, <laughs> the world should give you all of the money. Like, all I just right. want to give all the money to the Crypt of the Necrodancer people and be like, whatever resources you need, yeah. do it. You have brilliant ideas. I feel the same way about Yacht Club Games. I was say, yeah, and it's, Knight, it's tough because it's like, there's no way I'm going to be able to finish all of these things or even come close. But I, yeah, I feel just this embarrassment of riches, and I'm I'm glad that people can have these wild and weird ideas, like rhythm dungeon crawler roguelikes, and not only they can come out, but they can be successful. And Nintendo can be like, here is the Legend of Zelda. I think yeah, license. I just I just want to throw out the word Switch into this conversation, just the because Switch. the Switch is is I think doing such a service to yeah. a lot of these games <clears> that people <throat> missed. Uh, Hollow Knight, I waited to play on Switch. And yeah. Boom. Damn, is that game good? Brandon. <laughs> Damn, does that game get you immediately? Yep. <laughs> I went on my Switch last night. I was telling this to Abby, and I, like, hit on... You go all the way to the end, and you hit, like, all of my games. And I went through yeah. all of these. I had, like, just everything from first-party Nintendo games to all these indie games. And I was like, there are so many different types of experiences on here, and, yeah. like, most of these games are good. Uh, I, I'm impressed. Take your Switch. If you want to just treat yourself... Like, get an indie game that you've heard a lot about and maybe yeah. haven't checked out. Undertale is great. Baba is You is great. Crypt of the Next Dance is great. Hollow Knight is a masterpiece, and you should play it. Um, and just, yeah, take them. And you can do this on PC as well. I don't want right, to just limit right. it to the Switch. However you get these games, that's great. But, yeah, so much out there that's exciting. Kind of going off on a tangent, but it's a tangent of, of love. So I hope... Yes. I hope he'll be all right with that. Uh, Brandon... You talked about difficulty. 
and you happened to touch on today's oh (laughs) okay um oh excuse me it's been really fascinating i i got to go into like a sekiro hole where i only consumed and thought about sekiro for a long time and then i kind of like surfaced and saw what the conversations yeah. were about Sekiro. And people are writing articles, people are getting on forums, and uh, some people are like, this is the greatest thing ever, and some people are like, this is way too hard, unfairly hard, it's no good. And so that's going to be kind of today's otake. We're going to talk about difficulty. Right. And there was an article where they were, uh, I think it was Forbes, they said Sekiro should have an easy mode. And that's kind of how I want to open the conversation, is how do you feel about difficulty oh. in games, and do you think... Uh, Sekiro would benefit from having difficulty options. Uh, to me, my my number one, it's, it's about fatigue. It's like, if something's really difficult, that's great. You yeah. know, like, I think about, uh, it seems like a weird comparison, but I'm going to compare Soulsborne games to Super Meat Boy. Mm-hmm. Uh, very, very difficult game. A game where you're dying constantly. A game that kind of celebrates death, because when you finish the level, you get to see all of these just failed attempts that you did going through it. When you die, you immediately jump back in. So you're constantly like, okay, I get another shot, another shot. I am The experience is laser focused on that exact spot that you're stuck on. Mm-hmm. And the moments that uh, get, the, these games get tiring for me when it's like, you know, this, this damn spear guy <laughs> that I'm like stuck on in the mm-hmm. second row. Uh, it's not so much that fight itself that's not enjoyable, because I love being challenged by a different weapon type. I love that it's not like a big boss, like a big important plot point in the game. It's just like this very intimidating dude that introduces this whole new mechanic to you and you have to dig a little deeper in your skill tree and and test you in a certain way. It's the 10 minutes it takes me to get back to that guy. Mm. And so like if there was an easy mode or there was a way that like – because it's interesting when games – like I can see why people put this in games, but at the same time it's it's scary because – if you fail some, I can't remember the last game that did this, but like if you fail, it'll bring up a screen that's like, hey, do you want to, I noticed you died a couple times. Do you want to turn easy mode on? I think RE2 remake. I think that, that might be it. I think yeah. that might be the game. Mm-hmm. And what's scary about that is you, I don't think you can turn that back. Oh, geez. like you can load, a, you can load a save and go back, you know, to your, your previous save, but like you're stuck on that difficulty. And the moment I die in RE2, I'm going to tap, 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 go through the menu and it, oh, whoops. You know, like I didn't yeah. mean to switch it to easy mode. I just got used to hitting buttons really fast when that, you know, loading screen or when that, you know, getting back to the game screen pops up. Um, so that's the only thing. I think that's like the main thing. Thinking about where I'm stuck in Sekiro now, the boss is actually kind of fun. Like I got to a point in Bloodborne where I would cackle. You know, I would just, I would get wasted and I'd be like, that's hilarious. Right. Not only how quickly I died, but just how spectacularly, like how larger than life the boss is, how crazy the music was, uh, how I can kind of get a sense of the strategy, but I clearly don't have this boss figured out yet. Yeah. It's just like, man, that that slog to kind of get back mm-hmm. there is not something that's difficult. It just takes time. And so I, I wonder how much, how important is that? How much, uh, you know, is that to the core experience of a Souls game or a From Software game? So, Brandon, uh, let's let's pretend that that you're a suit, okay? The, you're uh-huh. you're you're a person who could make decision. I know, uh, <laughs> maybe a realistic fantasy for sure. you. I don't know. Uh, would you put an easy mode in Sekiro? Uh, if you I, had the power? Yeah. No, because I think. There's just so many games that are released every year, and I like it when uh, even like Battlefield dropping uh, Firestorm this last week. You know, it's like carries a lot of popular elements from from most battle royale games. Smartly, like it, it's like I'm not gonna rock the boat too much. Like I don't want you to be completely lost going into this game. But right, like right. that firewall is really interesting. That the weapons that you're using very different from a uh, PUBG or a you know Call of Duty. Um, the vehicles that you're using, just the world. You know, like the fact that it's destructible, and so. Uh, I, I want games to be unique. I, even when I'm not interested in something at all, uh, I think it's really fascinating to, uh, example, the creator of Her Story, Sam Barlow, I think, just announced Telling Lies is this new game. Mm. Much bigger, ca- better cast, noticeable names. Haven't seen the trailer yet, but it's like, I didn't like Her Story mm. at all. <laughs> like, I got that game, jumped in, and was like, I think the acting's kind of bad in this. I'm not into the, you know, really doing homework here. It's just, it's not for me. Mm-hmm. But 
I'm so happy this exists. I'm so happy that it's unique. Crypt of the Next or Dancer is probably not a game I'm going to spend time right. with, but unique, I think, is the, the biggest praise that you can you know levy to that game. And so uh, when I look at the industry at large and you see a developer not only kind of sticking to their guns with what they know how, how to do well, but slowly improving it, changing genres, experimenting with the format, it's kind of like, who am I to tell it to customize that experience to my, you know, to, to, to my, you know, because like I love open world games and like I'm swimming in it, you know, like right. they got, I got Days Gone coming out at the end of next month, you know, I still haven't still played Far Cry New Dawn yet, like for me to complain about what a developer isn't doing to cater to my wishes, I'd have to be like in a desert, just like there's nothing to play and I've never felt that. Right. <laughs> so that's kind of where I come from. Brad, I'm going to throw the question to you. If yeah. it was up to you, would you put an easy mode in Sekiro? No. Uh, I think the game already takes some steps to make it easier in some ways. Absolutely. I feel like there is way more Buddha statues that you rest at compared to past games. Yeah. Jones, that is the one part in the game I can think about where it's kind of a run back. Most of the time, I feel like a lot of the challenges later on is like, there's a checkpoint right there. Yeah. yeah. You die, you're right back. Yeah. I, I think about the bosses that, that I personally struggled with the most. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is going to change from person to person, but the, the statue was right there. Yeah. It was like the game was saying, like, we know. We know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, what if I told you, Jones, it's already on the easiest difficulty? Oh. Like, if oh. you're super, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're I, super I know what you're talking about. sensitive to spoilers, skip ahead like 10 seconds. There's an item you can get in the game to make it harder. And also, in New Game Plus, there's an option you could take to make it even harder. Cool. Um, I think I think difficulty is such a tough thing in games. And I, I see where people are coming from, and I get their frustration. Yeah, of course. Of, like, I really want to get into this game, or I really like Bloodborne, and I wish I could love this game in the same way that I did Bloodborne. And I, I get that. I think that's a very sympathetic perspective. But I also think it's it's okay that some things aren't for everybody. Right. Oh, um, and, and sometimes I, I mean that even in the, like a most extreme sense. I really enjoy, I enjoy watching fighting games. And I think part of the reason why I enjoy watching fighting games is because I'll see them do things where it's like, I've never done that. I've never even come close to that. And I think it... it, it a celebration of skill, in a sense, can be a very healthy thing. I think it is... is I, I don't want every game to feel like, oh, yeah, if I spend a weekend through it, I could get through it. I, I don't think that's fun or exciting, and that's not necessarily what these people are saying. Um, but there are bosses in Sekiro where I was like... I hate you and I hate myself. <laughs> like you just have those moments, those those like soul crushing moments. And there were times where I died over and over and over again. I like I lost count of how many times mm -hmm. I tried fighting them. But to me, the the answer is like, did you make it worth it? And every single time yeah. when I got through it, I was like, that was amazing. Yeah. And I, I think it's I, I think Sekiro very smartly kind of instills fear in you in a really exciting way. Um, there is a boss fight later on. And I'm not going to go into specifics, but I, I I beat it and I thought it was over and I was like, that felt amazing. And then I realized that it wasn't over and I was like, oh my God, like it was a rush of emotions mm -hmm. and it was so incredibly awesome. And I feel like a lot of times in bosses in most games, it, I... I, I Sometimes there are games I'll finish and people will be like, oh, what was your favorite thing? And I'll like forget half the bosses. And in Sekiro, I can remember like every Things, victory, yeah. every moment happening um, because it, it pushed me so hard. And I don't want every game to be that. If every game was Sekiro, I don't think I could handle right. it. Uh, but I really think that Sekiro feels like a game where they had a vision. They wanted combat to be a certain way. They wanted you to feel a certain way when you were engaging in it. And the demanding nature is integral to what they're trying to accomplish. It right. doesn't feel artificial. It doesn't feel in there to be hard. It really feels in there to have this sensation of being a right. shinobi who, who overcomes larger-than-life circumstances. And so I don't, I don't think it's necessarily required. There's right. also pride in a company doing what they do. Right. Like, this is what From Software does. Like, yeah, that's like uh, their vision of what they yeah. want the game to be. Naughty Dog is known for just crazy animation, yeah. really, really Great carefully thought out yeah. scripts, uh, really believable character interactions. Um, uh, Don't Nod is really digging into story and choice, trying to like carry the mantle that the Telltale used to have. Mm -hmm. And so it's like when you, when the when the 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 murmurs first started to pop up, non spoilery in Slack, where you guys are like 
damn, this game's hard. <laughs> I was like, yeah. great. You know, like, I, I might not finish Sekiro. I don't know. You yeah, know, like, sure. I, I, I want to... Uh, uh, there's, you know, a demon through Dark Souls still doesn't speak to me thematically. Um, there's a kind of just an emptiness, a hollowness to it that is literally on purpose. The word hollow is literally yeah. used multiple times throughout yeah. those games. But the, the aesthetic of Bloodborne and Sekiro is my jam. And so I'm yeah. like, okay, I'm here for this because this is at least going to carry me through it. The music, the, mm-hmm. the, the, the dialogue, the characters, uh, the, the enemy design. Um, and so I... I think it's interesting. I think you kind of have to hold your nose to the grindstone a little bit if you're a developer and you're you're trying to shatter expectations. You're trying to push a genre forward. Uh, I think it, I think it's it would be tempting for me, uh, and I I would never be angry at a developer if they took things like a little too far. And you're just like, well, you know, yeah. you, you tried it, uh, and I I might not be into it, but I don't fault you for being like, right. I, I don't know, like. Is, is this interesting? There were moments of Spider-Man. Maybe you just pull my face off. I was like, this is ridiculously difficult. Yeah. And I'm really curious to see how that evolves in the inevitable Spider-Man 2. You know, like how those enemy types play out. You know, how those little environments where you're fighting all mm-hmm. these different things. How the waves, you know, if there's more clever ways that they can uh, uh, make that more accessible and less just like, this is going to suck. You know, if you really want to like three-star everything, mm-hmm. it's going to be a little not fun for a bit. Um <laughs> I don't mean this as, as a call out. I mean it to illustrate a point. Um, there's a, a well known uh, Monster Hunter YouTuber named Gaijin Hunter, and he came out with a video where he was like, I, I don't, I can't, I can't do it, guys. I can't do Sekiro. I'm sorry. Like, this game is just driving me nuts. I was like, oh, wow, okay. And then, like, a couple of days later, he had a thumbnail that was like, it finally clicked. Yeah. And, like, imagine that process. Yeah. Imagine, like, having a game beat you down so much that you made this video and you're like, I can't do it. Yeah. And then having that that road, not really to redemption, but having that journey. And I do feel that's what it's like. Yeah. Um, but there's a question that I want to throw at you. We are in, a, obviously, an incredibly privileged position where playing these games and talking about these games is, is part of our job. We just due to the nature of our lives, we have more time for video games than somebody in another profession, right. Right. perhaps, or another life circumstance. Um, to those people who are like, hey, man, like I get an hour to play video games every three days or a week or whatever it is. Uh, and they're like, I, I wish I could play Sekiro, but I can't right. put in the time. Like, right. what do you say to those people? I, that welcome to the last two weeks of my life. I, I like was had experienced such an extreme level of anxiety going into our anniversary events mm-hmm. uh, that like Thursday of last week I was like doubled over in pain because like I had just like an air caught in my stomach and I was just yeah. like couldn't sleep. And then I finally got through the weekend and was like, man, Monday and Tuesday are brutal, but like Wednesday night I'm finally gonna get clear and I can go back to division. I can get to thirty and go back to Sekiro. And then I got this damn cold. It's just mm-hmm. like ah. So it's like right now, I, like tonight, you know, I have time off. Will I play Sekiro tonight? I don't know. In this state you know being kind of like you know delusional a little bit and highly medicated like am i going to be at my best with Sekiro? probably not um but again i think it just fits more into knowing your style and not feeling guilty for not playing a game because you have to right um and uh yeah i just it's it's interesting like a lot of times like i will stare at you know netflix forever and just be like what do i want to watch or just like you know, if I have like look at my you know Blu-rays and be like, okay, like what what am I in the mood for right now? But there's just always at least three or four games. It's mm-hmm. just like okay, I, I like that that fit my temperament at any given time. Right. Uh, and so I just think difficulty is one of them. And like you were saying earlier, like I remember trying to learn how to snowboard, and that sucked so hard. It was painful. Like yeah. you know, like I would fall over when I'm skiing, and it would be like, oh, I collapsed a little bit. But like snowboarding's like it felt like somebody literally gri- like 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 the Hulk. <laughs> it felt like he grabbed me by the feet and went. Wham! You know, and I was like, that <laughs> sucks. Yes. And I was with my cousin, and I'm like catching up to my family, like, hold on, sorry. And my cousin was like, hey, he's like, I notice when you like move your back leg, he's like, you're really hesitant, kick it. He's like, just really just push your leg to get it around. And yes. I was like, all right. And I did it. It was like, there it is. Mm-hmm. That was it. It happened. Brandon. And so that, that was, it was physically painful, like to learn that. But like once I finally got to that point, uh, granted, I have not snowboarded a lot since, but it was like so gratifying. And so, I, for anybody that's like, just as a rule, I don't like these games. Like, you, you deserve, if you're a fan of video games, you deserve to feel that once. You yeah. know, like, whether it's beating the last boss in a fighting game or, you know, like, challenging yourself with a game. Like, even, like, Devil May Cry, like, is, yeah. you know, very yeah. challenging in parts. Um, it's so good. Brendan, uh, I... I Agree with you so hard that we're going to do introduce a new thing to the show. We're going to oh. call this agreement handshake, where I just like our 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 thought processes are lining up so much. We're going to have to find a way for when we disagree. We're going to have to come up with this, but I think a friendly handshake. Oh, all right. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Sorry, audio listeners, but just know that it was a very nice. It was good handshake. Um, 
I completely agree. And when I hear, and this, this is not like, oh, like if somebody is like, ah, oh, man, I gave up Sekiro. It just wasn't for me, or I don't have time. Like this is not an insult or me right. saying Absolutely. those people are wrong. Yeah, it's, I'm. It's not trying to belittle anybody. I get it. I get it. Mm-hmm. Like circumstances can be totally rough, and I'm very sympathetic to that. But I don't agree with the mindset of like all video games need to be fun all the time or like when I turn on a video game, it needs to fill me with joy. Like if that's the way that you want to approach it, I get it. Cool. Play what you want to play. Play how you want to play. I respect that. But I don't think the game itself needs to be that. Right. Um, and like you were saying, like when we when we talk about like skills, like playing a piano or learning how to snowboard, we kind of accept that you can't just do that, that, it, that <laughs> right. it takes effort, but the reward is there. And I get really frustrated in games that require a group where like somebody's just being a jerk or not paying attention or quits in the middle of it. Then I feel like I wasted my time or it's like we could have gotten through this if that person just like held up there into the bargain. That's when I get really frustrated. Right. But in Sekiro, I never really felt like I was wasting my time. Yeah. Um, and I know that there are people who out there who are like, I feel like I'm not learning anything and they do feel like they're wasting their time. But for me, like every death was a step closer. Right. And so it's like, yeah, I had hours of pain, but those hours of pain got me to those highest of highs. And it's like, yeah, even if you only have a limited amount of time and you get your butt kicked, like if you can just kind of train your brain uh, to accept that butt kicking, you'll go so much farther. Mm-hmm. And even with fighting games, I've had that. And, and and Hearthstone, when I play Hearthstone, I would like be so excited when I would like win an online match or when I would climb the ranks in Hearthstone. I'd be like, oh, I, I don't want to lose this yeah. or I don't want to have that confidence come tumbling down. But once you can train your brain to be like the losses are just as good because yeah. they get you to a better place, your whole world opens up yeah. and you're not afraid anymore. Yeah. And I think that's really Amanda really awesome. still plays Hearthstone every single day. And yeah. I love when we're like having breakfast and she's just like, oh, okay, well, all right, you can't win them all. Okay. And then like 10 minutes will go by and she's like, I won. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, that's so great. And, you know, so much about, like, t- to me, one of my big dopamine rushes is just collecting. I just love, that's why I love open world games, talking about division, yeah. all those little blips on the map that brings some people, you know, makes them crazy. I love that stuff. I love seeing little, you know, places I can go and stuff I can collect. And the skill that you develop from a hard game is you, you is with you forever. Yes. You can take that into anything. You right. know, like, it was tempting. I haven't done it yet, but it was tempting once I finished Bloodborne to be like, maybe I'll give Dark Souls 1 a try. Yeah. Maybe mm-hmm. I'll go back and try it. I never did, but, you know. Yeah. And I, I'm sure I could, you know, be certainly much better at it than I was the first time. I had no idea what I was doing. Brand, for I think Dark Souls. so much of Dark Souls would be like a joke to you now, honestly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I really think that. Not a joke. Maybe that's too far, but yeah. easier for sure. Um, I'm going to believe it anyway, Ben. Yeah. I, I'm like to strut down the street being like, it's a joke. I don't. Uh, I don't mean this as a as a point of arrogance or bragging, but like since I have finished Sekiro, I really feel like I could finish anything, and that's such a liberating <laughs> yeah. thing. Yeah. Like there's 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 games where I'm like, ah oh, man, like that intimidated me or that made me feel bad, but now it, it like has given me a level of confidence with just all games that yeah. it's like I'm really cherishing that. And it's like thank you Sekiro for giving me uh, that experience. Brad, I want to throw something to yes. you. Yes. So uh, Dark Souls doesn't really have a, a traditional easy mode. It's not like you can go and, and hit easy and suddenly right. enemies do less damage. But there is the Drake Sword. And that's <laughs> something sure. that I've used, that a lot of people have used, yeah, yeah. where they're, they're really intimidated by souls, or they hear how difficult it is, and it's just an item that makes like a huge chunk of the game easier. Mm-hmm. Sekiro doesn't really no, have that. It's kind of just, you, you got to do <laughs> well, it. Well, like, Souls games have summoned people to help you. Right. Right, like, that's a whole other element of the boss, game that we you didn't bring up. You can people to help you. Yes. Can't hear. Yeah. Um, do you think because it doesn't have those things, and I think summoning, summoning is the most relevant thing, um, and I've, I've read people are like, hey, man, like I played the Souls games and I really liked them, but I summoned for every boss, and that was great for me. What do you say to those people? What do I say to them? Like, um, that's okay. I mean, if the game isn't for you, yeah. it's f- not for you, I think if you hit a wall... I would come back like a day later or something to try it again, give it another yeah. shot. I feel like that really helps with me. Yeah. If I'm stuck on a part, I'll take a break for a little bit and I come back and you do way better. It might click with you later. You might be in a bad mindset or something like that. Things aren't just lining up. Right. I would say try it again. If it still doesn't click for you, if you're not having fun, 
Right. First of all, I, like I don't want you to waste your time. Yeah. Like it depends what you're looking for a game. I like that challenge every now and then. Like yeah. I don't want that with every game we're talking about, but like every now and then I'm really into the idea of like learning and beating my head against the wall. But when I get that aha moment, it feels so good. Yeah. Because it's so rare. But uh, I mean, it's okay if you don't like the game. I guess. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, like there's nothing wrong with that. If you yeah. if you play the game. You're just not feeling it? That's cool. There's no no problem with that. Absolutely. This is not a, a cult of trying to get you right. like Sekiro, but I do think it's interesting just throwing ideas out there. Yeah. Um, and uh, just a personal anecdote with the, like, take a break and come back, how vital that can be. I was on the very final boss of Sekiro, and we needed to shoot mysterious monsters, and I died and died and died, and I was like, I, th- like, I don't know, man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was like at that point where I was like, am I going to be able to finish this? And then we shot, and I did it like on the first try after I came yep. back. Yeah. And I was like, "This is amazing." So yes, just clearing your mind can help so much. It's been said a bunch, but it's really if true. If you're stuck nowadays, there's so many ways to get information to help yeah, you through absolutely. this kind of thing. And there's like, there's nothing wrong with yeah, looking anything it's, it's, up if it's you're okay. Yeah, don't worry about it. Like yeah. if you're stuck on a boss, you're like, hmm, maybe I'll look up a yeah, strat. strat. Maybe someone will make a video for me to help me understand something. You might look at something you never thought of before. It can help you get through the fight. Absolutely. Um, it's okay to seek help. Yeah, yeah there's that's, nothing that's wrong it. with that. Um, but another thing that I want to say that I think is interesting and doesn't get talked about enough or ever, really, I don't know if I've ever seen it discussed, is when you're playing a game that's getting, like, really high reviews mm-hmm. and everybody's like, oh, my God, it's amazing. Yeah. Like, they're just excited. Uh, but it'll make you feel worse if you're like, if you oh, like man, it. like, I'm I'm the piece of shit that's stuck on the first boss. Right. And this game is, like, a 91 on Metacritic. I, I won't be able to experience it. Like, you'll feel really bad. What I advise to you, and, like, just try it out, is don't see what people are saying. <laughs> don't read the get goods. Don't read the reviews. Don't yeah. see the glowing scores. Just, like... Don't make it about them or the game. Make it about you and be like, okay, this is what I learned from this fight or this is where I am. Like, you don't have to be where everybody else is. You don't have to complete the game. Yeah, you don't got to be a pro or anything. And I I do think sometimes just seeing that stuff can really influence your own mental state and taking a step back is helpful. Uh, Amanda really does not like challenging games, but she just has this weird mutant ability when I play like puzzle games or stuff where I'm searching for items just to be like, boom, right there. And I'm like, where? Oh, like, I didn't see that at all. Like she can just see an environment. She just grew up on King's Quest, Space Quest, Seventh Guest, all that that stuff. And so she, any game that you see that it seems like everybody's enjoying but you, I guarantee you that crowd is gonna be frustrated or not even have the patience for something that you love. It's just tough when it's like the game of the month, you know? It's like, right. the, <laughs> like the one thing that most people are excited about. Yeah, and if you are at the top of the mountain, and like I don't, I don't want this to sound preachy, just like maybe a better way to make it for everybody. If you are at the top of the mountain, and like I've been there, man, I've, I've done it, don't be like, oh, it was easy for me, right. or like, oh, you just have to do this. Try instead to like legitimately help that person right. or be like, oh, hey, man, it's OK, because then then you might find somebody else that you can share and geek out about with this experience. I think that's just like it's just going to make if you're at the top of the mountain, you're going to have a better time if more people are up there with you mm-hmm. yeah. um, and you felt like you you helped get them there. I don't know. Do what you want, I suppose. <laughs> um, are we ready for some emails? Yes. We are. Our first email comes in from Tyler. I don't think we've had an email from Tyler before. Oh, so hey, Tyler. If you'd like to write in and submit a question or tell us about your Sekiro experience, the email address is askeasyallies at gmail.com. Tyler says, hey, Ben. Been a while since... Oh. Oh. Never mind. Been Not a, a first-time submitter. Yeah. Proven wrong immediately. I just didn't recognize the name. Hey, Ben. Been a while since I've submitted a question. First year of college has been hectic, so it's just been a while. The past few weeks, I've devoted some downtime to playing games, so here's a question for you and the panel. Do you ever feel like pl- replaying games is a bit of a waste when there are so many games you haven't played and still need to get through? I just beat Sleeping Dogs for the first time, that ending, and felt incredibly fulfilled, and my next game was going to be Assassin's Creed Odyssey. But then PSN had a sale, and I bought Dragon Age Origins on my PS3. I beat this game on my 360 a few times a couple of years back, but I couldn't resist going back through again. 
even though I'm enjoying my time immensely, albeit a few irritating segments, I can't help but feel a bit guilty for playing this instead of one of the dozens upon dozens of games that are in my backlog. So my question is this, how do you personally handle replaying old games versus replaying new ones? What would you recommend to a busy college student wanting to play more games? Either way, my annual tradition of playing at least one of the Kotar games isn't going away anytime <laughs> soon, yeah. even if I'm <coughs> a tad guilty. What do you guys think? Replaying games when there's yeah, so man. much out there. Saves money. You have that confidence going through. I've played the campaign of GoldenEye probably like, I'm not even kidding, over 100 times. Yeah. Like just again and again and again. I like prestiged that game. Like mm-hmm. You have the four <laughs> dossiers in the loading screen. They're yeah. 100%, every single one of them. Like I, lo- I would love that uh, <laughs> as a new way of talking about games where it's like, yeah, I've prestiged that. Yeah, yeah. 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 prestige. <laughs> yeah. What do you think, Brad? Oh, no no problem with playing old games. Yeah. I'm way cool. Sometimes I just want to play an old game. Like I recently just played through... Uh, Link's Awakening again because yeah. I haven't played it since back in the day, and I was like, "This sounds really fun to me right now." Yeah. Do you ever do you ever feel guilty though no. when you're like, "Oh, I'm missing out on this no, or no, that no, no, or no, no, whatever"? No, no. Nope. Because nope. I'll be playing it because I don't want to yeah. play something else. Yeah, I, <laughs> uh, I, I agree with you guys. I really don't have a counter to that. Um, but for me, it's just sometimes you need a reminder of why you like something, mm-hmm. like. Like, and sometimes you just want to go back to that space. Sometimes, like, medicine is visiting an old friend, you know? And, like, sometimes I just need to put on Metal Gear Solid and have right. my world rocked all over yeah. again. Um, oh, whether the Castlevania it, games, dude. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Switch. Let's forget about it. Through all those, uh, yeah. <laughs> like, five times. I feel like we say it every Symphony episode. Symphony of the Night just constantly is like, you want a symphony? Right. right. No, Symphony, I, no. <laughs> we talk about it a lot, and I think the reason we talk about it a lot is because it's something I devote a lot of time to thinking about, but... Outside of us, you know, games aren't your job. No, you're, you're here. Right. Yeah. You're here to to yeah. love it. And whether it's getting beaten down by Sekiro or playing Yoshi's Crafted World, or you know, replaying uh, Dragon Age, like that's okay, man. Yeah, just yeah. do it. it so good for everybody. Yeah, I do think just with the internet and social media and being of the moment, th- there is even subconsciously this element of like I gotta do this. Yeah, and you don't, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't gotta do you it. You don't gotta do it. But yeah, thank you for the question, Tyler. Thank you. Next one comes in from Brandon, and his subject is the future of getting video game announcements. Hey everyone, last week PlayStation put their prepackaged direct style state of play together, and it made me wonder what I want to ask you now. Are we on a path where press conferences at set times of the year are becoming part of the past or with us presumably at the twilight of the generation? Is getting prepared presentations at multiple times of the year the default way to get new announcements until the next consoles arrive where we get back to substantial updates and reveals? Which do you prefer, and more aptly, which do you think is the better way for games, both big and small, get their reveals to the world? Thanks, as always, for taking my question, and stay easy, fellow allies. Go ahead. I know you want to talk about this. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, I think we are seeing the death of the multi-game mm-hmm. on stage press conference. I think that is going away. Yeah. I'm, I'm sad. I love making fun of people that try to attempt <laughs> those things. Did you? I, I, I love the highs and lows. Yeah. I love being surprised. Uh-huh. I love the, you know, pulling up the sleeve, Grand Theft Auto 4. Like, I just, like, those to me oh, are, really? you know what I mean? Like, those to me are memories as important as the trailer that I've first seen for the first time or a game I played for the first time. Like, they're so special. Right. And as somebody who comes from a theater background, I, I greatly respect the difference between, like, a Phil Harrison and a Reggie fils meaning that Phil is not very dynamic when he speaks. Like, I'm sure he's a very, very smart man, but he's just not, he, he doesn't really have the charisma of a Sean Layden or a Reggie fils And it's interesting seeing people that are better at that than other people. Um, what I think will not go away, thankfully, is like Mortal Kombat, you know, like, because that was not only, it was fun to, you know, break out like 20 smoke machines and have like orange neon and, and like really decorate the space, but I want you there to play it. So, right. um, you know, it's it's not just that, like, we're going to do it on stage because it's the best way to do it, but it's like, you, you're here, yeah. you know, because I need you to have impressions and I want to make a big public thing about that because I think, um, like, kudos to people to do that. I think there's, uh, to me, that, that, that proves, you know, kind of a confidence in your product. Uh, I tend to be a little more uh, favorable towards, you know, games that do that because they're unafraid to just poof, here's the game. You know, yeah. like, you know, I, it's like my number one question whenever I see CG, uh, CG trailer, uh, uh, Vampire the Masquerade, Bloodlines 2, when that got announced. It's like, do we have gameplay? Like, no. Like, oh, okay. Uh, it's probably not the time yet, but it, it like, 
it's tough for me to hang on to that game in terms of like what I think it's going to be or my expectations. Like I'm just going to kind of put it in the back of my mind, forget about it. And then I'll be reminded of it when we do get gameplay, when we do get another trailer. Whereas Mortal Kombat is so close to launch. It, you know, had such a great announcement. So many people came directly from that event. Overwatch, man, it's mm -hmm. like such a great moment where it was not yep. only like, God, these characters are good. Man, this music is good. God, this world is good. Wow, it's a new IP from Blizzard and I just played it and it feels so good. Yeah. It's just like, how can you have a better announcement than that? Yeah, I think you can come at this from a lot of different angles, but if, if it is the way of the future, I'm actually for it because I've watched a lot of press conferences that weren't even like funny bad. They were just boring. <laughs> And it's like there's there's so little here. Not that like going this new way will necessarily fix that, but I think it could help. Like mm. I wasn't super impressed with the state of play thing, but it wasn't that long, yeah. which was also super nice. So I, I do appreciate the efficiency. If you are worried about like not getting those Konami like press conferences or some of those legendary Nintendo <laughs> press conferences, what I would say to you is never underestimate big companies being dumb or being out of touch. Yep. Uh, it will happen no matter what. And I don't. <laughs> I, I'm really not trying to pick on them, and I know we've picked on Gearbox a lot, but did you see that Gearbox presentation? I watched 30 seconds of it. It's all I could take. It it was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm not, I'm not even, I'm really not even trying to say this as an insult, but like everything that could go wrong yeah, right. yeah. went wrong. Um, and it was kind of beautiful to watch unfold. And I, I actually do think Borderlands 3 looks great, but uh, yeah, I, I think somewhere out there, like we experience technical difficulties all the time. Dude, if you're worried about game. embarrassing, awesome moments happening, like it's, yeah. it's still gonna happen. Yeah. Um, but as far as like big things, I think things can change and still feel big. Um, like I think a Nintendo Direct can be as powerful, if not more powerful, than E3 press conferences. I think a state of play could 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 get there. It, right. I mean, like. Just because things change format or style doesn't necessarily they change importance. Like it just depends on what they announce, really. Right. Like we can have a legendary moment and it could just be a random video that drops on a Wednesday. Right. Like as long as the announcement is awesome and the thing that they're announcing is awesome, I think you can have it. Um, but I do think it is changing. I think we've the like, state of play is very indicative of that. The okay. way Xbox has changed up stuff, I think, is indicative of that. Like it is changing yeah. for sure. It's probably uh, a lot cheaper to that too. Question. Yeah. Our last email comes in from Morgan, who asks, no more legendary franchises? Hello all, hello all from the beautiful Colorado Springs. Mm -hmm. Is there room for any more staple franchises in video games? I'm talking about your Mario, Tetris, Pac-Man, Zelda, Street Fighter, Minecraft, etc. These franchises will likely be played by our grandchildren, but all came out at a time before oversaturation was an overwhelming issue. Because of this variety of choices, even... Because of this variety of choices, even Fortnite is likely to fade away when the next big thing comes along. Does the panel think there is room in today's market for a legendary franchise to emerge, or are these days long gone? I mean, some franchises still exist. Like, Halo's still around. Like, that came out years ago. I mean, that was way after Mario and everything. But could today's environment produce something that is as legendary and long-lasting as Halo? Hmm. Probably, yeah. I think so. I don't know what it's going to be, but I think there's always room for more. I think the thing with legendary franchises is it takes a long time for them to reach legendary status. <laughs> yes, yeah. It's not like a thing that just happens. Like right. <laughs> I would argue that The Witcher is now legendary. Sure. Um, and you know, it, it took a while to get there, but I think that that name alone carries such like fucking Geralt in Soul Calibur. Mm -hmm. Right. That, like that didn't happen with The Witcher one, no. but it it slowly did build up and happen. I got one for you. Yeah, uh, I think Horizon is going to be something that's going to be around for a while. Yes, Horizon will be around. I think I Horizon agree. can completely uh, uh, get new characters. You know, yep. Love yeah. Aloy. I'm excited to get back. You know, especially given just how that how that story wrapped up. I'm like, yeah. Ooh, dying for Horizon too. <laughs> like, really curious to see where they take this world now. Yeah, and um, yeah, it just takes time, and um, it uh, yeah, it's an extremely terrifying thing to do uh, to not only try a new franchise but to like go back to it right. uh and um uh yeah i think we're totally we totally have room for that uh, look last of us you know it's like, yeah i think that is like approaching legendary status it, from, from a it was felt so weird when naughty dog um oh, i'm getting all my franchises confused because i'm medicated right now naughty dog <laughs> didn't do jack and daxter naughty dog naughty dog did what yes naughty dog did do jack and daxter okay yes, they did, yeah. when they stopped doing jack and daxter it was like what yeah. you know and then uncharted came out and it was like well what's this weird thing right. and now it's like you know it's huge we're, we're literally full playing through you know yeah. an uncharted game right now in the studio as we speak right uh and so 
Yeah, I think it's... You, I always want to see Legendary born from sales. Obviously, is a huge part of it, but like, I want to see that passion. Like, I want to see. Uh, so, even someone like Halo, where they're talking about kind of taking it back to its roots, mm-hmm. it's like it might be time. Right. You know, like I think uh, uh, it's exciting to see that game grow, yeah. that franchise, try new things. I think another thing to consider is the the committee, quote unquote, that gets to decide what is legendary changes over time. Like right. people get older and younger people grow up, and so those that are dominating the conversation, they might care a lot about different things mm-hmm. than what you cared about. And they might, you know, over, like that's why I think over time when initially the response to something is super negative, like you talk about the Zelda cycle or the Sonic cycle, the people that get older are like, no, it was great. And here's why they have a whole new perspective on it or they, they encounter it at a different point in their life. Or like for me, and I don't know about you guys, but like nothing is ever going to replace Zelda, uh, not just because right. it's high quality, but I encountered it at a very specific time in my life, and I can't go back in time and replace that with something else. Um, and so I think that's a huge part of it too. But yeah, and uh, just shout out to God of War and Tomb Raider and Doom, right. and like so many franchises that went back to just the right. name. And they were like, in God of War's sense, like it is a continuation of the story. In Doom sense, like just wipe the slate clean and start over. Yeah, but God um, of War to me feels like legendary in an all new way. Yeah, where it was mm-hmm. like, yes, yep. it was legendary before, but now it it it's legendary in a way that feels new. Like yep. it feels like a new series in an exciting way. Uh, that was really cool. Brad, hmm. uh, so Brandon gave me Horizon for something that could be legendary. What do you think is a contemporary series, a relatively new series hmm. that could be? up to legendary status new series yeah i always i don't know if it's this is new enough but i always thought mass effect has legs like it could keep yeah. going even more like people love mass man effect. mass effect has had an interesting and it's arc, like, huh? if like all it takes is one good comeback <laughs> right, yeah. right like if they make a one crazy good game it could be back on its feet in no time and i think people are ready to devour that man people I are think ready the, yeah the, the hunger for mass effect is is so real do you think destiny could be a legendary franchise Maybe I don't know. It just depends on how long Bungie wants to go on it, I guess. Yeah, I, I, it's it's interesting. I don't, I wouldn't hang that so much on innovation and more on how Bungie feels. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. Like, okay. man, it must be exhausting to yeah. work on that game. Yeah, it must I, be exhausting I, dealing I with the business side of it, and you know, really like. It's, you know, as much as I'm talking up the division, like what a wonderful place for the division to be, to be like, thanks for screwing that up. Now yeah, we're right. going to, you mm-hmm. know, like take those lessons and pu- uh, put the sequel out. And uh, they really kind of, you know, blazed the path and uh, took some hits for it. So, yeah, I feel bad. I mean, like, I think Call of Duty is a legendary franchise. Like people yes. love Call of Duty. And like I st- I've talked to younger kids and they're like, oh, I love Modern Warfare. Yeah. World War II. They just love those games. Yeah. Like how we loved GoldenEye and stuff. Mm, GoldenEye. It's crazy. Mm. It's crazy. Uh, good questions. Thank you for writing in. Thank if you, you want to write in an email one more time, that is askeasyallies at gmail.com. Uh, thank you to my panelists so much. Thank you, Brandon Jones. I knew you were sick, so thanks for toughing out I these two and a half hours. I felt better every minute of this podcast. Good. <laughs> good. Lots of Red Bull. And yes. Brad, uh, you've done back-to-back <laughs> episodes, yeah. so thanks, yeah, for, yeah. thanks nice. for doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I bet it's kind of a weight off your shoulders to have that Sekiro script done. The script's done, but yeah. the review's not done right, yet. Right, 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 right. When right. that's done, then I'll feel good. We'll get there. Um, and thank you all to our wonderful audience for watching. And we, this, we're 78 episodes into this wild ride. 78? 78. This good is episode wow. 78. Uh, yeah. That's like, what, 4,000 hours of frame trap? I don't know. Infinite. <laughs> infinite frame trap. <laughs> but thank you all so much for watching. We will see you next time. 